We're back with Hannah Wallen, round two, because I definitely wanted to get her back on, especially uh, the, the proverbial stars align. And, you know, it, it's been Mother's Day, like last week or so, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and that's that's kind of a, a, the bulk of the subject we're talking about is 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 mothers. And uh, well, um, how, how, how have you been uh, before we get to the nitty gritty of this? Well, uh, bu- busy as all get out, mostly. Um, I uh, the, the job I do is one that lost a lot of workers during the COVID crisis, and then we're just this year starting to recover people as as people start to realize that they they do need a job in order to pay their bills. Right. Um, but I take care of intellectually disabled adults. So I'm a direct support professional, and it's not a difficult job for someone who has been a mom, um, because you a lot of the things you do are similar, even though you're not mothering them. So I've been working overtime almost every week for four years. Really didn't yeah. think about it that way, but yeah. So I've been I've been it's been kind of crazy. How about how's thing been things been at your end? That's pretty uh, uh, straightforward, really. Like no particular, you know, uh, tragedies or dramas or anything. Like most of the time is, you know, I, I'm working on various projects, kind of like a, kind of like a queue system going on, I'm dabbling in a little bit of this, a little bit of that, working on like like maybe a dozen songs at once uh, yeah. for, for new music and uh, like ha- about half a dozen new ideas for writing for AVFM videos and that kind of stuff. So uh, I, awesome. somebody, somebody's probably going to say, you better focus on one thing, dude. But um, uh, it's, not, it's just not <laughs> the way I, uh, uh, like if I do something, you know, if I start on something, I've got to like write something down. I got to uh, be sure I get back to it later and everything like that. Um, and, 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 and there's that. And uh, on my off time, aside from spending time with wife, family who, and what have you, uh, lots of Magic the Gathering. Um, I've been playing Standard a lot and Modern a lot and Commander a, a, a metric ton of and uh, trying to get myself immersed in other games, trying to persuade other people to play other games like Sorcery Contested Realm, which I'm really, really liking, but still don't know, don't know anyone to play with yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like yeah. this kind of stuff. So. I, I, you sound so much like most of the musicians that I know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know anybody who is a musician that doesn't have multiple projects going at the same time. It's, right, yeah. it's hard to shut the inspiration off when it's there. And then when you get writer's block for a while, it's, you know, you take a break and you work on things that don't have anything to do with the thing that you're blocked on. And, and then you go on. And well, like my my brother's yeah. like that too. He usually has multiple projects going on at the same time. Yeah, because uh, you know some of the some vivid ideas come up when I'm doing trying to like trying to focus on some other routine away from that. Like at least two songs originated in the shower, and yeah. much more than that originated in the car. So, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, th- th- those places should be considered sacred, you know, ground basically because they're more met more. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, attuned to meditation than places designated for that kind of thing. In my yeah. opinion, yeah. So, but yeah, um, this, these should be considered holy grounds <laughs> for the creative yeah, person. <laughs> your brain doesn't respect that. I get, I get um, article ideas in weird places too. Especially like, I have an argument with somebody on Twitter about a subject, and it gets me thinking about um, the lack of agency involved in the. Accountability gap, the lack of female oh. agency, yes. and then I'll go off to you know I'm getting ready for work and I'm getting a shower and all of a sudden the exact wording I need to express this so that people will understand what I'm talking about pops into my head and I have to remember it yeah. <laughs> so I can right. get downstairs and type it. Mm. Bottlenecks of thought they, they yeah. kind of have to get kind of cleared out uh, in other places I guess. I think yeah. it's because you relax in those places and it makes you. Yeah more open to you know sort of your what's in the back of your head trying to find its way out mm-hmm. yeah i uh, just came up with a possible solution to a 
to a work problem uh, in the sh- in the shower just recently, and because I'm a programmer, because okay. a lot of, a lot of it's you know uh, about trying to think over problems. A lot a lot of our time is spent on that, but you know you kind of need these diversions as part of the job, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. All right. So speaking of Twitter, so let's get started with something. So we saw quite a bit of drama regarding the supposed importance of SA. HMs now S H A A S A H M. I can't even do the the, the, the acronym right. Uh, Stay at home moms for those that are not familiar with that uh, acronym. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So we got we got some of that drama some time ago. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember if it was early this year or later part of this year, but but it happened. Uh, can't uh, can't remember much about the top of my head, but let's get your thoughts on the horde of women that talk about how stay at home moms are equally important as men's roles and the conflicts we saw when some of us pushed back and said they just can't compared to a lot of men's jobs well for one thing it's it's not that hard it's not like it used to be um and and uh, this is something that you know i i have difficulty with stay-at-home moms because they're hypocrites uh, about about one thing in particular uh and i it, it really really sticks in my craw because i had to deal with it with my husband's ex-wife, right? Right. Um, they talk about how hard it is to be a, a mom and everything that moms do in terms of parenting the children, every aspect of discipline, every aspect of nurturing and caregiving, men do that too, all right? And then they work on top of that. And stay-at-home moms will get mad if the dad claims his work as a father uh, is is the same nurturing, but then they'll also get mad if they leave him alone with the kids and he calls it babysitting. Like they, they yeah. want to be the primary parent. They want to be claiming um, superior status as a parent. But then when, you know, the dad takes that at face value and says, OK, well, I guess I'm not as important, so when I'm staying with the kids, I'm going to call it babysitting. Mm. Then they get mad. No, these are your children. How dare you call it babysitting? Be their father. Like, make up your mind, lady. Right. But yeah. the worst part of it is they'll talk about moms who work because we have to. Like, moms who work because the budget doesn't work if we don't, um, as if we are neglecting our children. And not doing our job, right? But if a if an ex wife wants to be a stay at home mom, she will go whole hog after his income, her ex husband's income. And if there is a a child in his second marriage, that kid can just go fuck himself as far as the <clears throat> the the stay at home mom is concerned. And if she's she won't be sympathetic to the situation at all she'll just say well you know stepmom can get a job and uh, i had three i had three jobs when my kids were growing up right you know and that that was for supporting my family and my family included two stepdaughters they were over frequently you know so i as far as uh stay-at-home moms are concerned i don't hold it against them in terms of, of they meet a guy, they get married, their philosophy together is this is the way we should make our family. That's their business. They can do that. Um, they should stay dedicated to it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you do that and then you divorce him 10 years later and you demand alimony and child support and all kinds of stuff because you got bored and left, which is what happened with the ex-wife in our situation. She got bored and she screwed around like three dollar hoe and then she left. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I mean enough that you know, there there had to be STI testing because uh. she was really prolific. Um, but in any case, you know, if, if you're going to do that, then I have no respect for you as a stay at home mom. But if you are like the stay at home moms in my family, who took care of their children through their their uh, formative years, through their 
school years and everything. And then when they graduated high school <clears throat> and the kids were in college, then mom got a job and helped pay for college. Mm-hmm. You know, like that. I have a lot of respect for that. You know, sure. there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're not making dad do that. As long as it's something that you guys talked about and you both have the idea that this is the way you want to do it. Um, people mm-hmm. should be making those decisions for themselves. It's right. not what my husband and I decided for our family. And that other people feel that that is what was best for their family does not make it what was best for ours. And the big thing that really bugs me about stay-at-home moms is, like I said, their hypocrisy. Because obviously, if that's the best thing for the family, they shouldn't be sabotaging other women's ability to do it. Mm-hmm. And the the sanctimonious attitude they have toward other women. Like, you're telling me that because you didn't do both jobs, like women like me did, that you're better. But, but you're not. Right. Neither one of us is better. We both did what was best for our personal families. You fill the space that's needed. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I saw I see a lot of the argument uh, coming from the non-feminist side here that if a woman has to work, you know, they they love using the term. I've probably said this before somewhere, but they love to use the term wage slave. Like, yeah, like conservative people are using Marxist terminology, basically, to, to kind of describe. So, so 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 it's OK for the guy that the father to be a wage slave, but not the mother. Right. So uh, I, I just thought that was a really bizarre phenomenon to see coming from from the conservative side to, to use a term like that unironically. Yeah. Well, and I've had them, a lot of them have talked to me like, you know. I was um, a cashier all my life or something, or I went to work in an office all of my life for something. I, I worked for a newspaper. I worked in uh, two bakeries. Um, I've worked in medicine, um, bottom rung, but still medicine, and uh, two different roles, um, similar, but nurse's aide and uh, direct support professional have differences about them that are that are real specific, so they, they have two different types of education you have to get um, for them. You know, it's just a few weeks, but you still have to be certified. And I've done a bunch of different things. I've been an uh, adjunct professor at a university. I've been a wedding photographer. I had a 25-year professional career in photography and um, wedding album production, video production. Um, I, you know, I still do that. I, I, and I'm doing it on a shoestring budget. Because of the things I learned previously, I've owned businesses. I've been part of family businesses and friends' businesses. I mean, I've had a pretty, pretty uh, busy life in terms of uh, the, the different things that I've done. Yeah, and, an active life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I've even been a crafter. I I used to sell crocheted jewelry to goths um, back in the day. <laughs> So I'm like, and it, it's kind of cool because I like I like glitter goths. Glitter goths ask for the coolest stuff, and then it looks really cute on, on them, you know. But what's, um, what's and we're glitter, talking glitter both goth? sexes. Glitter goths, like your regular goth, usually is it, they're into you know heavy metal or death metal. They're like mm-hmm. metalhead kind of goth, and they're usually yeah. into um, darker clothes. They're usually wearing band t-shirts or snarky commentary on, um, you know, society. And you see a lot of things that make you look tough. Um, Not necessarily biker gear per se, but stuff with spikes on it, a lot of face jewelry and stuff like that. So the difference between them and glitter goths is that glitter goths will add neon stuff, glittery things, shiny, sparkly things, um, the girls will add hair extensions that are quite obviously not hair, like really thick, puffy yarn and stuff like that. Yeah. That is think, neon. And I they think look I know really what cool. you're talking about. Yeah, I think I've seen a few of those now that, now that you mention it. Yeah. And you'll see more goths at like a death metal concert, more yeah. uh, old school goths at a death metal concert or punk, um, anything like that. But glitter goths, you, you find those at raves. Um, 
Yeah. So you're, and you'll see a lot of them will be into more um, hallucinogenic rather than like if they use drugs, old school goths are probably in a pot. Um, right. But if they if they're using drugs. Glitter goths, I usually hear from them about, <clears throat> you know, what kind of uh, hallucinogenic trips they've been on and, you know, how interesting it is and and the stuff that it enlightened them about and, and all that stuff. I'm not a big, I'm not in really big into that at all. Um, I'm afraid I might be allergic. <laughs> so, oh, right. I have so I have so many bad allergies and um, there's evidence of something called mast cell activation syndrome, which means that I could become allergic to something at any time that never bothered me before. So I don't want to try anything that if I have a, an emergency and I try to go to the emergency room and explain what's happening to me is going to yeah. mess with my ability to do that. Mm-hmm. So I don't, right. I don't take anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Makes- that makes sense yeah yeah but yeah um i so i I did all that different stuff like but they all talked to me like the only thing i ever did was work a a cash register at a grocery store or something which i actually have never done um and and they'll be like well you know you wage slave this and blah 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 that well how can i be the slave if i'm the one who owns the business Right, exactly. Yeah, your own your your own slave. Yes. You're enslaving yourself, man. I have enslaved myself. Please shoot my captor. Wait a minute. No, don't do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. They, like left. The left really likes using that ar- argument uh, that you're a slave because you have to work for money. Like I, I just kind of it's not worth responding yeah. to at this point. So. I actually got into a long argument with a Marxist about this, and and I pointed out there is no point in the history of humanity, recorded or unrecorded, uh, or or even in our development pre Homo sapien status, mm-hmm. right, where survival didn't involve labor. Labor right. is just doing activity or thought. To solve problems that that basically uh, involve your acquisition of resources, and resources are just things you need to live. So before we had jobs, we had to hunt and gather. There wasn't right. this thing where, like, if you did none of that, you ate anyway, right? <laughs> Unless you were a baby. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the the way to Eden, the Star Trek episode where those hippies came on board the Enterprise looking for their Eden. You know, they were they were all going to have have the good life and just lounge around and eat and not toil or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, the planet that you landed on turned out to be completely poisonous. <laughs> but and, um, and it's it's the dumbest argument. I mean, there's the alternative that they're offering is essentially. Going from having the ability to, to determine how much you earn in terms of resources. And, and we use currency as a substitute for resources. And then you go get the resources you want with it instead of having your boss pay you in potatoes and, and you wish it was steak. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but so you get currency. And if you want potatoes, you can go get them. If you want steak, you can go get them. If you need to pay your mortgage, you can pay your mortgage. You know, all that. Yes. Right. But right. under communism... Instead of being able to say, well, I need more currency so I can get what I want, uh, instead of I only have what I need and I don't, you know, I, I'm stuck with that and I don't like it. Under commun- communism, you don't get to decide that. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't get to decide I want more currency because that makes you the bad guy, even if you're right. willing to work extra, even if there's a need for you to work extra and you're the one willing to fill that need. Like in my situation, in my job. Um, we, we go into, uh, group homes and we take care of the people in those homes. So there might, and we're talking a home that's in an actual house. It's not a facility like a hospital or nursing home style facility. There's an actual house with bedrooms and a kitchen and bathrooms and, um, the bedrooms, the number of bedrooms is the number of roommates. And, uh, so you go in and you work, at, at, when I work at night, 
mostly it's cleaning. If you work during the day, it's things like, you know, cooking and helping people with things that they need to do. If they have to go someplace, you take them. If they need to go grocery shopping, you're there with them when they do it and so on. And uh, that, that that job requires a certain number of people um, to to caregiver ratio. And so they can't just not have enough people. There has to be somebody to fill that role. Well, if they don't have enough employees, that means that there are extra hours available. So if I'm scheduled on a night shift so many days a week and they don't have second shifters, I go in for a double shift and I work 16 hours instead of nine um, or 17 hours instead of nine, which during the crisis, we did go over our 16 hour limit on a regular basis because of that, Um, which it used to be something that the federal government would go after a company for and they actually the crisis was so bad they had to give them leave to work people longer hours than the law allowed because you couldn't get other people to do that job so under communism um they would have had to appeal to a communist government to allow people to work more hours and pay them an incentive to work those hours or they would have had to mandatorily force people to do that job. And it'd be one thing if you're talking about working in a factory with machines and the people coming into work could resent what they were doing and be angry and not care about the job and everything without causing anybody any harm. But I work with a very vulnerable population. And if somebody doesn't want to be there, and they don't care about the people they're taking care of and they resent being in that job and they resent the work that they have to do that puts my clients at risk for abuse right so under communism if they let my clients live because communists do have a history of killing off people like my clients nazis yeah. and communists both did that um you know we would be in a situation where we would have to be more vigilant about abuse and and uh you know if they force people to do that job it would almost be an inevitable result so these people don't think when they use these terms and they normalize like they get mad about the normalization of this or that that they disapprove of but they're quite happy to normalize the idea that somebody who trades with you becomes the bad guy if the thing you're trading is labor and the thing you're getting is currency. Exactly. I mean, uh, it's really civilized, uh, if you really think about it, the, the idea of currency. You know? Yeah. Because, right, right it's, it's basically uh, your work made concrete as a value that you can then kind of spend according to your values. Yeah, you you end up in a situation where you don't have to have just the right thing. You know, barter systems, the really big weakness of barter symptoms is what if nobody wants what you have? Right. Exactly. But everybody wants currency. They can trade it for anything. Yep, absolutely. So, One thing that, yeah, right. Yeah. One thing that's been going through my mind, uh, this this does relate to the stay-at-home mom thing. Um, you know, we in the men's movement, you know, we, we rightly talk about the importance of fathers. And, you know, there's a question that, uh, when I contemplate this is that, is there a discernible important importance as such of mothers in children's lives beyond the fact that they give birth to them and nurse, nurse them and so forth. I think we've kind of, I kind of approached you originally with this kind of subject. Um, like, you know, being ju- not just a mother, but a grandmother yourself and a respected figure in the men's movement, I figured this would be the perfect question for you. So I'd like to get your th- thoughts on that one. If you understand my question. Yeah. Well, when I look at, um, when I look at, you know, my own childhood and I look at the different ways that, that my parents, taught lessons growing up a lot of what i learned from my mom and you know was was the same kind of lessons i was learning from my dad but from a different angle so when you have one parent and not the other um if that parent is a stellar parent you're still only getting one angle you're not getting both right um so it's better to have both parents in that in that realm uh, but when it comes to 
when it comes to moms, there are some very solid and important things that that moms are supposed to do that are vital for the welfare of their children that modern women are not doing. One of those is, yes, the father is of vital importance to the child. The quality of man you choose to make babies with matters quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you choose to make babies with a man that hasn't grown up yet, for instance, and he may be an adult, but you know, bi- biologically an adult, legally an adult, but he may not be psychologically an adult. Mm-hmm. You know, you may you may find a guy that is completely immature as a, as a woman. You should be vetting him for character. And a lot of women are just sleeping around until they get pregnant and then collecting child support but not getting married. Or they're getting married and then getting divorced. Um, very important for women to control when the family is started. Um, that was that was the one that I screwed up. Right? My son should have been about four years younger than he is. And uh, it really created a situation where there were there were a lot of our struggles that that came from me fighting tooth and nail to shield my husband and my son and my stepdaughters from the consequences of my failure to wait and my failure to control my fertility at that time and a lot of women think i'm really harsh about that when i talk about that well i'm talking about it from personal experience there are things that I couldn't stop from happening to my kids that should not have happened to them. And they've all had a hard talk with me about it. Like we've had this discussion where I've said, you know, these things happened because I didn't wait. This this is my fault. And you guys shouldn't let this happen to you and your families. Because you didn't like it when it happened to you and your kids. And you don't want it to happen to your children. And, uh, you know... I I have wonderful kids. They worked very hard to try to make me feel better about things that I shouldn't feel better about. Um, But the very important thing uh, to take from that is that it's important to communicate to other women, don't let this happen to you. And the worst thing that I've noticed in women right now is they are offended about not letting that happen to them. They're offended at the idea that life could be better and they might have the control to make it better and protect their families from from going through worse. Right. Uh, So that's one thing that's really vital in a mother and children need that from their mother. Um, It's useful in 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 a way also for a family to have the ability to tag team time with the children like my husband and I worked opposite shifts when the kids were young it wasn't easy we didn't get to see as much of each other as we liked but we both got one-on-one time with the kids and we both brought money into the into the home although I brought most of the money into our home because everything that he brought into the home was taken right back out by the government and sent to the ex-wife so, I mean, there there's a lot of things. Mothers do the softer end a lot of times of, um, I guess, ethics training. You know, yeah. when we when I broke the neighbor's window uh, by accident, which yeah. it's it's I think I've told that story. It wasn't entirely an accident. I did something I was told not to do. And the consequence yeah, yeah. was the said, window got broken said on the, the HBR, one of the HBRs. I think you were talking about that. Yeah. I, I was supposed to not c- climb the walnut tree out behind the house because it was in a location where its roots were limited. Its root system was limited, so its branches didn't get very big. And lo and behold, what my mom said was going to happen happened. She told me it would break, and um, I got up high enough, and it did. And that wasn't really a big problem because I could, I could climb anything, but – a walnut fell and hit a branch and bounced off the branch and broke the window of the bathroom in the neighbor's house. And both of my parents had discussions with me about it. I always talk about what my mom did. She asked me 
you know, to, to look at the burden that I had placed on the neighbor. It's going to cost him money to fix that window. Um, and so she hired me to do extra chores over and above my chores and she paid me minimum wage. And when I earned enough, I went and covered the cost of the window. Yeah. And, um, but, but my dad also talked to me about it and he talked about, you know, you, you don't necessarily obey rules because you approve of them. You obey rules because they're in place for a reason. And if you think that the reason is wrong, then you appeal verbally and you have a discussion or an argument. You don't just go out and disobey the rules because sometimes there are things you don't know. And my mom hadn't brought that up, right? But my dad's not the one that brought up how the neighbor might feel about spending the money that he might have had it earmarked for something else, you know, and all that. And, you know, we have this long conversation and even with the insurance, she's like, yeah, if his insurance pays for that, it'll go up. His cost will go up. He'll pay for it out of pocket one way or another. So you're going to pay for this window. So it, both of them had different outlooks and that ability to have that united front with different reasoning and different things to explain to the child. The child gets a much bigger picture when both parents are working together. The child gets to see what love is like between two parents that are dedicated to each other. Um, the the child gets to see what kind of partner to choose when yeah. when their partner is. And both my brother and me had that growing up because of we we had both of us had great same sex parents and great opposite sex parents. Yeah. So yeah, um, it's yeah, not so- not that moms are unimportant. It's that there's not a specific role that you can say all moms have to do this, right? Moms, moms can be more like the water of the family. We can fill in spaces where we're needed instead of being vain about our, uh, our role must be this. And, and if it's not, then we're not doing it right. Well, one thing I hear a ton of is that is the over importance because they are the ones that give life. A lot of women like to use this argument when it comes to saying that the mother is like the prime or the most important parent. Uh, even though my re- rebuttal to that would be that both the mother and the father are the life creator. I mean, you know, the the mother may deliver it, but uh, yeah, wh- why are we ignoring that both had a hand in this? Hey, women talk about that like it's a godlike ability. Exactly. But rats do it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what it is, it's a privilege. I get the first nine months, you know, and and I'm <laughs> I'm going to be selfish about it. I'm keeping the child inside the whole time. Right. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, it's not selfish. The kids uh, in danger if, you know, premature birth is, is dangerous for the baby. Yeah. Um, my my younger stepdaughter actually was a preemie. Now, there's a story for you, too. Um, my, my husband's ex-wife is much shorter than I am. She's a tiny little woman and she was not weak. Like she was a gymnast. She was, um, in, on the gymnastics team in school and she wasn't a wimp either. She, um, she fell and broke her neck in gymnastics and she had to learn to walk all over again. And they didn't think she was going to do it. And she was like, oh yes, I am. And she did. And she has uh, some some handicaps from that. Like, you can barely tell. If you don't know the story behind that, then you wouldn't understand why when she gets tired, she shuffles a little when she walks. But uh, so there are things I can respect about her. She She's not a lightweight. But everybody has limits. And when the equipment is big and heavy and you're five foot three and you weigh 98 pounds soaking wet with rocks in your pockets, you are going to be counterbalanced by the the equipment. And if you try to pick it up and carry it around, that's not happening, especially, you know, right after giving birth. So one of the things they tell you with a preemie is skin to skin contact is vital to the child's survival. You need to have um, lots of time where The baby is just in a diaper and is able to press up against the skin of the parents. And my husband is a pretty, pretty big guy. Um, And he's always been super strong, like much stronger than his size would would tell you. 
So he could carry that equipment around and, and he could carry the baby with the equipment. Mm-hmm. And so while she was recovering from birth and the baby was in the most danger, he's the one that carried her around with her monitors and her machines to to make sure that she got that skin to skin contact. And uh, to this day, she's she's a daddy's girl, um, which I can't blame her because she has an awesome dad. He's every bit as awesome as my dad was. Um, but, uh, so it's, again, this idea that women do this alone, I'd have died in childbirth if my mom and my husband hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a nurse who thought she knew everything about birth because she was a woman. And so she looked and she saw what part of the head had crowned and she thought, oh, it's just a little tiny baby. My nine pounder had to be cut out. He was he went 11 days late. He had extra time to grow. He was almost a two-week-old baby by the time he was born. And uh, right. so I, you know, I always joke about it. I had, I had a uh, person trapped inside my body whose struggles were threatening to kill us both. And a, a team of assassins had to go in after him with a knife. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and it, it all turned out well in the end. Like... It's funny because uh, you know most babies when they when they're born they uh, the cold air hits them or you know they're not happy about their situation because they're not uh, comfortable in the uterus anymore and they scream and yell and he comes right. out and he's like Ew, ew, ew. <laughs> you know like but but yeah um, I needed them and I I needed him I needed my husband through the whole pregnancy. You know, you're vulnerable when you're pregnant. It's not something that you do by yourself. It is teamwork. Just because you're the one holding the baby doesn't mean that everything the baby's father is doing for you doesn't count. Exactly. Right. One thing, uh, you know, not just mothers, but femininity in general kind of gets that over glorification, I think. Uh, one pet peeve of mine uh, is the, the term mother nature. I've never thought of nature as just a feminine thing. Well, like a lot of people kind of make this argument, but I think nature is interaction between uh, metaphysically male and female elements. So I'm not fond of mother nature as if she is like the big thing that uh, that, that that makes it happen. I think there's well, if we're using that kind of uh, analogy that their mother that the parent analogy it's mother and father nature but who's who listens to me <laughs> yeah people do that with uh, nature and time mother nature and father time um but the reality is that. you know when you i don't know what got that started i would have to go back and i think father time probably came from chronos mother probably. nature probably came from the celtic uh fertility goddesses and uh, fertility deities did come in both sexes if you go around the whole world. But I think ancient people thought of um, goddesses as fertility deities more than gods because they didn't understand how conception uh, occurred exactly. They understood that the baby came out of the woman's body, grew inside and came out. And some some cultures believed that the baby was put in there fully uh, formed but tiny by the father and and then grew inside the mother and then until it was big enough and then came out. Um, you know, so like there are different different cultures had different beliefs about that. But I, I imagine it probably came from old mythology. But in terms of nature, there's. Um, examples of masculinity and femininity and male and female and the teamwork of the two sexes throughout the animal and even the plant kingdom. Um, I personally am wildly aware of that because every time the trees in my neighborhood get the horny, uh, it's, it's like the movie The Happening is taking place inside my face. I'm, it's bad enough I want to claw my eyes out. But uh, and there's not enough allergy medicine in the world. 
Um, you guys can hear it sometimes in April in and sometimes in March. Um, when I'm doing the show, I will just sound awful. This year wasn't so bad so far, but yeah, it, it's not, it's, it's kind of dumb for people to try to make one sex over and above the other based on the idea of fertility and childbirth, because we have as, as of yet, we have not made it happen, um, that, that a person was born from from just one sex of parent and and grew up had a normal childhood and grew up and and uh, turned out fine mm-hmm. we've seen evidence that it can happen but not with women right well more even when it comes to the social subject uh uh when in terms of like the importance of women in society as supports one thing i hear sometimes in our own movement sadly is that this this is kind of this is what sticks in my craw is the notion and i paraphrase the purpose of women is to civilize men i've had a lot of problem with that statement because it downright implies that men are savage uncivil by nature and by that extension women are angels bestowing civility to men so it's all because of women that we have our civilization which i hate that uh, basically. well but, uh, how many of the ancient philosophers were women actually how many of the modern how many of the philosophers of the enlightenment were women because the ones i hear about the ones whose names are the most famous those are men it was men who invented democracy we keep hearing about how great that is and how terrible that is it was men who invented every aspect of order an organization within our society that is designed to protect people from from conflict between tribes and as we get bigger you know warring states um, with the idea that well maybe we can make arrangements so that we can trade together instead of fighting over resources men did that women didn't and when you look at the the history of rulers Rulers that were female were more likely to start wars. They were more likely to engage in conflict rather than use diplomacy. So, and and I will admit, I'm not very diplomatic unless I really want to be. And when I am diplomatic, it's for the sake of of being a better person on the outside than I am on the inside. Um, And that that struggle is going to be there for the rest of my life because quite frequently on the inside, I am an asshole. (laughs) Um, and it's, there's a, I I always joke about, you know, some, some people are born without the bitch gene uh, and, and people are like, like, there's no such thing as a bitch gene. Yes, there is. It is the X chromosome and men only get one. So they're not as bad about being undiplomatic unless they're raised without a, a man to show them as they're growing up. This is what men do differently than what boys do and uh women women we get two x chromosomes and we are more likely to we're more likely to be the person that turns away the stranger at our door because that stranger might want to take things away from our family and it's not it's not that women are evil it's that men and women protect the people that they love in different ways yeah. Then as a result, if anybody is civilizing anybody else, I would say men civilize women. Okay. Uh, you know, we would be the ones that yeah. if you put us on an island um, as as kids and and uh, gave us a knowledge of survival techniques, we would have be be killing each other like Lord of the Flies by the end instead of, right. you know, cooperating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, to, uh, I can already hear the feminists and, and and some on the conservative side saying that, like the feminists would be saying, well, uh, they weren't female philosophers because they didn't let them be, ph- men didn't let them be philosophers because <laughs> patriarchy. How are they going to uh, stop them? You, right. you think and you write things down, and then later when other people see it, they decide whether it was a smart thing to say or a dumb thing to say. 
Right. Yeah. That's not exactly a limited thing. Right. And then the conservatives will be saying, well, we inspired these men because we are women. We see we, we civilize the, these men because uh, <laughs> I, I, it's yeah. just something that I, I, can, I can hear them talk. Yeah, it's, right. it's another one that drives me nuts. So mm-hmm. there's there's a grain of truth inside a whole like if you ever see those great big tapiocas they put inside of uh, uh, boba tea, you know, uh, like bigger than the tapioca and the tapioca pudding i'm not sure oh i there, there's one in my neighborhood they have it's like the half the size of a gumball um that the, they have to have a big straw to <laughs> get them up out of the drink they're they're like they're bigger than a sweet pea and normal tapioca pudding like if you get tapioca pudding um those little tapioca balls when they absorb moisture they get slightly smaller than a sweet pea but in the middle of that, there's like a, a little tiny grain where the moisture just hasn't reached. So it hasn't absorbed it and it hasn't expanded. And uh, the rest of it is all this fluff. So human beings, male and female, all when they are inspired by a goal – I want to make sure my family is safe. I want to make sure my kids have food. I want to be the person that I want them to uh, admire and try to be like when they grow up so their lives will be easier. And all of those different things or even just um, I want us to have a car that's not going to break down on the way to grandma's house. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, You do better. You work harder. You get up in the morning when you're not feeling great. You don't have that second beer, you know, at the at the bar with your friends. You come home. Um, you don't you don't drink when you go out to dinner because you're going to drive and your kids are going to see you do it. All of that stuff is because of the people that you love. So the grain of truth is that yeah, w- women can do that, but they're not unique in doing that. Women do that. Children do that. Men do that. I work hard at being a better person because I want to be the woman my husband loves. And he is an an excellent person. He has a heart the size of Texas. And even though, uh, you know, he's going to have boundaries like a normal person, he is, um, it's hard to explain without, I don't want to make him sound like a pushover, but he is he is a very kind and loving and gentle person. And I guess I will put it this way. He's incredibly strong and he knows it. He knows how big he is. He knows how strong he is. He knows that he can break people if he wants to. And he's very careful how he uses his strength because it's a hell of a weapon. And, uh, you know, he's he's very gentle with other people because of that. And he's also highly intelligent. And that's another weapon. He, he also has the capacity, if he wanted to, if he decided he wanted to be an asshole, he could take advantage of people and they wouldn't know it. He could hurt people and they wouldn't fault him for it. You know, th- those kinds of things. But he's not that kind of person. He wants the people around him who are his friends and family to be safe and happy and uh, enjoy companionship with him and to enjoy him enjoy companionship with them. And so he acts with love toward everybody around him. So he is somebody that I look up to and I admire and I try to do the same in my life. Um, I'm not always as good at it. Like I get really harsh with people that are, I I see as being willfully stupid. Uh, like there's a lady I've been, I'm I'm using that term loosely, by the way. Um, there's a lady I've been arguing with on Twitter who is very in your face. Um, women should be able to do whatever they want with their reproductive capabilities and men should just be forced to support that and, um, you know, just sh- shut up and go along with it. And one of the things that I point out is 
again, it's women who have the most control over that situation. You have not only starting with, you know, whether or not a guy even feels comfortable approaching you. Because if you have, if you give off, don't come near me or I'll call the cops kind of vibes, that doesn't happen, you know, unless there's something wrong with him. Um, But uh, so you have from that point on every step of it, he's beholden by society. He's beholden to you for um, consent. And from hello to let's spend time together to, you know, let's get naked and, and do the horizontal bop to let's use birth control. What kind of birth control? How much birth control? Because a woman has, you can combine three different things as a woman uh, for your birth control and still demand he uses a condom. And if each one of those is 99% effective, you have an infinitesimally small chance of pregnancy. Like you'd be, you'd have a better chance of winning the lottery while getting struck by lightning than you would getting pregnant under that circumstance, right? So you have that control. And Men's lives could be better. Women's lives could be better if we taught that to girls and they understood it and they made use of that information to prevent unwanted outcomes and give their children the best start in life. Right. So when I talk to women and I say that and things are the discussion is about what what results do you want? How can you get those results? And they get mad and they're offended that I haven't blamed men for everything and held women unblameable. Mm-hmm. That pisses me off, and that's right. where I fail. I completely fail at controlling my temper under those circumstances. So I want to wring people's necks. What the hell is wrong with you? Why do you want to make that more important than the outcome? Yeah, that makes sense. Because uh, you, I didn't really get much of a talk from my parents about the whole sex thing. I mean, I kind of understood that sex equals very likely possibility of uh, uh, of a child and, and the result. So it was just so bizarre to me that people my age should know, should know this, but they keep you know uh, keep doing things that result in unex- in underage pregnancies and so forth. Like uh, it is kind of mind bog. It was kind of mind boggling to me at the time. Just you know why why would you do that? Uh, why won't you even protect yourself? Uh, even that's kind of in the mindset I had. Yeah, if I was a if I was a sex ed teacher, I'd be gamifying this. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about it. Let's compare it to um, being the being the tank in a in a game where you know you have different characters, like a D and D based game, Dungeons and mm-hmm. Dragons based game. Sure. Uh, so for people listening who do not play tabletop role-playing games, you have different types of characters with different types of skills. And your battle capability is measured in numbers. And your your opponent's numbers and your numbers are kind of the same sets of numbers. You have how many hit points you have, and you have how many hit points you can do in damage based on, on what, you, uh, what you carry around. The tank is the fighter-type character that usually has extra hit points, and can do extra damage. But the other factor that's involved is armor. And armor can reduce the amount of damage that you take, while your weapon can increase the amount of damage that you dole out. And so when talking about birth control, if you talk to kids about it, that's your armor. And the right. condition of not being pregnant has so many hit points, percentage points. It starts out with you only have a 20% chance of conception at any given time during the month. It increases during ovulation. It decreases for a while after um, the the uh, ova has made it too far or ovum has made it too far down the track without getting fertilized even if it does, it's still going to get flushed out at that point. And you're not going to drop another one for 28 days after that one dropped. So you have some time where you're not fertile. So your rhythm method is your first armor. 
and actually never some no nobody should ever rely on that as birth control but if you're trying to have a baby it's useful to know mm-hmm. um your second armor is the condom sperm can't affect the ovum if it can't get in right mm-hmm. but that that can that can fail there's there's still that one percent chance that that can fail so girls should understand they can raise their armor class their armor uh, class against getting getting pregnant mm-hmm. by using things like spermicide, um, yep. their own barrier method, which we have more than one. You know, we've got the diaphragm. We've the female condom kind of sucks, but and yeah. you don't want to use it with the male condom because it kind of ruins things. But we have the diaphragm. We have uh, spermicidal foam. We have the birth control sponge. So there's three different things you can pick from there. And then there's also other things that women can use. There's something called a Nuva ring that has, if you're using hormonal birth control, it's an implant and you don't even have to think about it after you've put it in. You've had to, your doctor put it in. Um, there's implants you can get into your arm. There's shots. You don't even have to worry about, like my, my big screw up was not paying attention to timing on taking birth control pills. Okay. Um, so you don't even have to take that into consideration if you as long as you're paying attention to i have to get this shot on this date um and and so on it's much easier to schedule that than remember to take your birth birth control pills within a two-hour window every day Mm -hmm. so it's to me the bulk of the responsibility for that should be on women and women don't have anyone to blame but themselves if their outcome is something that they weren't planning, that they didn't want, because right. they could have done more. Mm-hmm. And if you gamify that, when you talk to, to girls about it in terms of, um, you know, this is these are your tools to protect yourself from this unwanted outcome, and now you can decide, all right, when we uh, form our relationship, when I, I meet a husband, we get married – I want to have this, this, and this done before we have the baby so that when we have the baby, we have enough money, we have a secure place to live, you know, all the things that uh, you think about and when you're trying to plan for your child, um, that those tools give you that control. That you can say, all right, I'm going to do these things until I'm ready to conceive, and then when I'm ready to conceive, I, I can stop. Now, right. that's going to change uh, in about – in about two years, it's going to change very dramatically because there's going to be a birth control uh, method come out for men. I don't remember what they're calling it here in the United States. It's been available in India for a while. It's called Rysug. Okay. And they finally – the Parsimus Foundation, I think, is the one that's that's funding it. They finally got it to the point where the FDA is going to approve it, and uh, they're looking at FDA approval in – uh, 2026. Mm-hmm. What Rysuk does is it actually shreds the the sperm on the yeah, way I think out. I, I think I heard that. Yeah. And it is it is more effective than condoms. Mm. So uh, it, it's a second thing. Guys can use that, and then if they're not 100% confident with it, they can still use a condom. And it'll basically take it out of women's hands. Women will no longer be able to accidentally get pregnant without a man's consent. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, but I, and, and men, yeah. I'll, I'll, guys, I'll I think are more likely to respond to it being gamified even than girls. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, so this could protect against, uh, like some woman kind of sperm jacking. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's that's big. Yeah, I I can't wait for that to happen because I want to see how how much the um, unplanned pregnancy uh, situation changes over the next four or five years after that. Once it yeah, sure. starts to become affordable for men to be able to just get that that shot, it's a shot, mm-hmm. and it it's I think lasts for like ten years. Um, ten. Yep, it's it lasts a long time, and it uh, there's another shot you can get to dissolve it if you want it prior gone prior to that. 
um, and it's 100% reversible. So there's no wow. reason to avoid it. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I it men being able to just you know shut off the works and say, mm-hmm. well, you, you know, you can't you can't obtain sperm from me that will fertilize anything. Um, that that actually I think would uh, prevent a lot of pregnancies. Yeah, that'd be well. Yeah, that, that's huge. Yeah. Yep. And um, I I think it'll say a lot too if um all of a sudden the unplanned pregnancy rate bottoms out because of that, mm-hmm. or even just drops significantly. It's it's going to women are not going to be able to blame anybody but themselves for that they're not going to be able to you know it's it's basically going to prove that when men do have that control they they put a stop to it when women have the control they don't right i mean such simple things they just don't do and would rather take on the hassle that comes out later instead of the simple steps you can take yeah 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 Yeah. and it, it just it it makes no sense for something like this to not be available for men. Exactly. I can expect some pushback from the abortion industry as well, maybe the vasectomy industry when this kind of becomes more mainstream. If it, oh, yeah. Yeah. The abortion industry is going to be really the, the big one. Um, yeah, I think I the vasectomy industry, the procedure can be done by the same people who do vasectomies. Yes, and it's a simpler procedure with less likelihood of putting the physician at risk of, of any kind of malpractice lawsuit because all you're doing is a simple injection. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty pretty easy to handle something like that. So and and also part of the responsibility then would also be um shared by the d- drug company rather than falling just on the physician in, in the case that something did go wrong. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I don't know. I don't think the vasectomy industry would get upset about it, but the abortion industry would because yeah. that is primarily women capitalizing on um, fooling other women into thinking that their best option in a situation where they've already made a whole series of unwise choices is to quote solve the problem by killing their babies exactly which is like the most unnatural choice you can make and Mm -hmm. it 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 creates obviously even if you were not looking at it from the moral end there's also the psychological end and it does create some some serious psychological uh damage when a woman goes through that so these women and and there's a lot of actual physical risk as well that they don't talk about yes. yeah. so these these <clears throat> these women taking advantage of other women and i know that there are men in the abortion industry too but if you actually look at it it's primarily um it's primarily run by women planned parenthood is primarily run by women and it is yeah. the biggest organization the the people at the upper echelons of it are all women uh, mm-hmm. Most of the nurses involved are women, and uh, some of the physicians are men, but it, most of the physicians involved are also women. So uh, I, they're going to be mad. They're mad sure. that women have alternatives to abortion. They're trying yeah. to shut down uh, places that help women who want to choose not to have an abortion um, by by providing, you know, supplies and assistance and getting a job and things like that. They're trying to shut those places down because they don't want them to have alternatives to abortion. Right. So if men are able to uh, prevent unwanted conception from happening in the first place, the abortion industry is going to get really mad. They do around half a million to three quarters of a million abortions annually in the United States. Right. Seems like, you know, for all this talk about women being the more civilized creature, a lot of violence comes from them, not just the war and things like these too. It's like, 
there's so many disproportionately, at least it seems like to me, female voices in the whole uh, pro-abortion side of things here. You know, the life givers, they kind of have this power trip, I think, because, you know, they can, you know, take and give life as they see fit. That's, that's just what, kind, of, kind of the way. Pretty I'm arrogant. Seeing it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's an interesting difference between men and women. Right. When men realize that they have a lot of power in a situation, uh-huh. my experience is that 99 times out of 100, right, when a man realizes that he is in a position where he is um, not just overpowered, uh, but but dramatically so, he is very careful to not step on the people around him. Uh-huh. Right. He's very careful to work with everybody and uh, take care of the people around him. Um, I, I don't know if I don't get into all of the discussion of, about Alpha, Beta, Zeta and all that. Yeah. But one of the things I did notice in that conversation is that when Alpha animals are discussed, non-human animals, yeah. um, it's pointed out that the alpha isn't just the biggest, strongest, throw his weight around guy in the the um, group of animals. He's the one that is responsible for the safety and welfare of the rest of the group. Uh-huh. And men aren't any different than the rest of the animal kingdom in that. But when women find themselves in that position, they take and take and take and stomp and slap and bitch about every little aspect of other people's capability and power in this situation. They won't take responsibility for their power, and they certainly won't take responsibility for using it to for the benefit of the group um, or using it in a way that is harmless to the group. And it's about 50-50 from what I've run into with women where you get that kind of behavior – as opposed to uh, trying to trying to benefit the group, and among those that do try to benefit the group, the majority of them try to do it by controlling the group instead of supporting the group. So, um, a really good example going back um, when I was a kid, I grew up in a neighborhood that was mostly boys. Mm-hmm. There were a few girls in the neighborhood that were my age, like maybe a handful, but the overwhelming majority of females in the neighborhood were more than six years older than me, Mm. or they were more than a few years younger than me. Um, Once I got into like elementary school age, you know, there was a, there's a crop of babies that had more girls among them. Mm. So I kind of grew up in a girl desert and I think it was beneficial to me to a degree because it helped me i had to uh i had to learn to be one of the boys in order to have people to play with mm-hmm. and so i couldn't just be um a controlling asshole and so when i was a little kid uh, you know like elementary early elementary age um when i was at school i would notice that if we were going to play a game and there was a group of us playing The girls made the rules and then got mad if the boys didn't agree to them. But when we played at home, um, you know, at at school there would be fights over this. And at school there would be lines drawn and no talking to this person for this long because, you know, I, I didn't listen to the rule or, you know, they didn't listen to the rule or whatever. Um, but at the park when we were kids, mostly what we played was monkey bar tag and football. So nothing like nothing that, that was just sit around and, you know, no tiddlywinks, right? Not even tag most of the time, unless it was monkey bar tag. Um, you weren't allowed to touch the ground for monkey bar tags. So, uh, it was, it was a little more dangerous. Everything was a little more high risk. Um, but at the same time, we would we had a leader usually and the leader sort of fostered civil discussion of what the rules were going to be 
and we all worked it out together so that everybody agreed and it wasn't the girls making the rules and then getting mad if the boys didn't follow them it was well we've all kind of agreed that this is fair so this is what we're going to do and Mm -hmm. and uh you know or like with monkey bar tag that got handed down through generations so sometimes we would agree to modify certain rules um but most of the time it was just uh this is this is the way the game has always been played. So unless somebody's objecting, this is the way we're going to do it. Um, and and it really struck me as I was, you know, getting older and starting to think about differences and how people acted depending on their gender and everything. The girls were kind of mean about it, and some of the rules were really arbitrary. And some of the girls would make yeah. up rules because they would benefit themselves. Sure. And. Uh, you know, I, I could have probably done that and it, people would have thought it was reasonable because I had asthma really bad and had a rough time running. But mostly it was, you know, this this girl didn't want to wear um, shoes that were made to play in. So she would make a rule that, that you know, if, if she stopped, she was invisible, you know, or some crap like that. And but it would only apply to her. And she would get mad and go, well, my shoes aren't, you know, and right. she wasn't allowed to take them off. So we'd agree to it. Um, but but a lot of times it was it was stuff like that. Right. And that changed mm-hmm. for me my seventh grade year. Well, my sixth grade year, really, when we started playing more rough and tumble games in gym class. Yep. And there was a boy in my class who had muscular dystrophy. He was in a wheelchair. It was an electric wheelchair. Yeah. Um, he had very, very limited movement with any of his limbs. He had one hand that, that worked pretty well, and he had a joystick on the arm of his electric wheelchair. Yeah. So he could move that around and everything. We started playing dodgeball in the sixth grade in gym class. And he would play dodgeball with us in his wheelchair. Well, right. we were not going to take advantage of the wheelchair that wouldn't be fair right so we had this discussion and it was the same boys that i grew up with at the park that were the leaders like they there were there's always at least one of them there right so they kind of got together and were like oh how, how can we make it so doug can do this with us and um I, they worked out well nobody else is carrying around a big inanimate object that if you hit it they're out so you can't hit his chair and get him out if you hit his chair, it's like hitting the wall. But nobody else is going to bruise like him if you bean them with the ball. Like, we can all bean each other. That's fine. But it would be mean to bean him. So you can't throw the ball too hard and fast to get him out. You have to be gentle because that's fair. It's, you know, we're, we're trying to make it equal. We want The goal is so that we can play with him and have him be part of our group because he's our friend. Mm-hmm. Right. And we had a whole set of things like that. So if he he can't pick the ball up and throw it, but he can hit it, he can use his wheelchair like a bat. And he's actually pretty good with that thing. So that's how he throws. He throws using the chair. And and uh, you know we had that whole thing laid out, and he got people out that way. Yeah. And you know sometimes he was out, but he wasn't usually the first person out. And it was fun you know, getting to play with our classmate and we had, nobody was like mad about it or anything, but it was the boys that solved the problems because they were willing to talk it out and reason out what would be fair and what would be reasonable um, accommodations to make sure that we could include our friend in our games instead of him having to sit off by the sidelines by himself and none of us getting to play with him. Yeah. That makes sense. So that's it's a big difference between boys and girls, and I think it doesn't have to be that way. Right. Um, I think girls can grow up and learn that, but unfortunately, girls get coddled. Yes. Girls get coddled in two ways. One of them is when girls tattle, if they're tattling on a boy, the, the adults automatically 
basically act like the boy must have done something wrong because he's bigger and stronger. And somehow having the bigger capability puts you in the wrong, right. even if you're not. So that's the first one. Um, girls are not called out on being unreasonable in, in, in a lot of circumstances. Um, my parents didn't do that to me. They, uh, if I was, if I was being unreasonable, they flat out told me that's silly. Don't, don't, you know, go there. And they'd explain it if I needed it, but, uh, they were, they didn't pull any punches on that. Like, why are you making him do this? What's, what's the matter with you? You know? Um, but the other one is if, if girls are upset about something, they get treated like by virtue of being upset, they must be right. And right. it doesn't matter whether they're upset or at a boy or a girl. This, the minute there are tears, they must be right. And that's not true either. You can be mm. totally, completely, 100% wrong about something and still be upset about being confronted about it. Yep. And uh, I've growing up i've seen girls be upset because they were embarrassed that they did something wrong and then they get away with it because they cry and mm -hmm. that's another one my parents didn't let me get away with you know right. they could tell my my dad especially could tell the difference between like sad or angry tears versus embarrassed tears mm -hmm. and he would say you're embarrassed aren't you and i would you know yeah and, and he he well okay just like when your feelings are hurt or when you get injured or when you lose something that you wanted you know, or you don't win something, there's a lesson. What is it? What's the lesson? What did you learn? Right. And we go from there. I didn't get a lot of – I didn't get shamed a lot over uh, things when I was a kid you know, that, that were behaviors that were unacceptable. I got taught to evaluate myself and do better. Mm -hmm. So I guess – my parents gamified growing up <laughs> yep. um yeah. but from that i learned that you know the difference between how i was raised and the environment i grew up in versus a lot of the girls i went to school with that there are different approaches that seem like they're naturally male or female and some of them might be more naturally male or female but when it comes down to it a lot of it is socialization yeah. And boys, the accountability that we put on boys, the agency that we recognize in boys, girls need some of that. And I think at, in history, girls used to have more of that than they have now, even though they never had as much of it as, the, as boys did. And it made them better partners growing up yeah. than they are now. Mm -hmm. Right. A um, little bit on the crying thing. It seems to me like, you know, the more you want someone to see you crying, the more I distrust it. Mm -hmm. And and, and uh, when somebody kind of goes away to kind of be by themselves to cry, well, um, I, I think that is the opposite. Um, uh, let's just say, uh, without going into too many details, uh, the, uh, some, some girl, kind of a relative of ours, uh, basically kind of accidentally tripped and, you know, and, and fell, fell down after being kind of being hyperactive. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and she, it seems like her pride was hurt, and she kind of just went away by herself to cry instead of just kind of crying to mom, to mommy or whatever. And uh, so and I just sense, uh, I know what her pride is like, so I kind of sense that was that was the case. Um, so, but yeah, there, there's that. Um, yeah, yeah, it seems to me like girls can, or women, could really turn on the waterworks uh, like an on and off switch like like for whatever i've been watching a lot of colombo <laughs> it's like a, sometimes yeah. when, when, the, when the perpetrator is female they could really turn on uh the, the, uh, the water so to speak uh when 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 it's most convenient for them <laughs> yeah you ever had one of those um one of those uh faucet setups where the handles have had so much uh hard water corrosion or or buildup of like minerals on them that they're hard to turn yeah, i know what you're talking about yes <laughs> yeah so with the waterworks with girls a lot of times that goes only in one direction turning it on isn't mm -hmm. difficult at all yeah. turning it off very difficult 
and I hate it. I hate mm. crying because I get a headache, uh, you know, and it, the really rough thing with me about headaches is I don't feel the pain from them. I get other, I, my vision is messed up and I'll get nauseous and, and stuff. And I can feel it's like somebody has the palm of their hand, like right up against where the base of your skull meets the back of your neck and there's mm. fingers going up and I can feel pressure and, uh, it's so it's a really weird discombobulating experience for me. Um, mm-hmm. But because I'm female, my tear ducts didn't change the way boys' tear ducts change when they they hit adolescence. That makes mm-hmm. it harder for them to cry even when they need to. Yeah. And so, like the worst thing you can do if I fall down and you see me fall down and it looks like I'm injured is immediately come rushing over before I have a chance to compose myself and say, are you okay? Because it doesn't matter. I could be 100% fine, not injured, even though it really looks like I am. But as soon as somebody asks me that question, my body is going to cry without my consent. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it, I, I, I've worked really hard to, to try to get control over that. And it, it never has been something that I've had easy success with right my brother described to me what it was like for him when he decided he was just going to quit crying over little things Mm -hmm. and uh he was upset about something i can't remember what he said something like he he stubbed his toe or you know cut his foot or something it was just a and he was just crying like a a little kid does and he was a little kid not you know he didn't wait till junior high or something but all of a sudden it just occurred to him this is stupid why am i doing this it's not uh helping it doesn't feel any better so I'm going to stop. And then he did. And I would bet that that was, you know, early, early onset adolescence, <laughs> and, <laughs> right. you know, a little bit. But uh, yeah, for, for women, unfortunately, there's a lot of women who will exploit that. Um, yeah. Tears, tears are a signal to the brain for the people around you that you're vulnerable and that yeah. you're suffering. And if the people around you are at all sympathetic to you, they care about that and they want to do something to alleviate the situation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of women and girls do not try to shut off the waterworks. Right. And, you know, some of them, some of them are pretty good at turning them on when they, uh, when they want to, as opposed Mm -hmm. to when it's involuntary. For me, I, I'm not very good at that either but partly i think it's because it's harder to start doing something that you hate doing than it is to start doing something that that you're okay with even if you don't necessarily like it and my tear ducts aren't right even if they haven't dried up so i ugly cry like (laughs) really ugly cry like my tears come out my nose first so right, yeah, I, yeah. I end up with you know, like snot on my upper lip and everything. And then you might not even see tears in my eyes. Um, I have to use eye drops every day. Uh, so, yeah, it's fun, fun aspect of I have a it took 50 years to find out. I have a connective tissue disorder called uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And it's yep. it, there's a whole spectrum of weird things that yeah. happen with it. But uh, in any case, yeah, it. it um I think girls take advantage, not just in terms of, you know, like having an easier time crying and and everything, but they take advantage because they know that this is a way to get people to protect them and give them what they want. Mm -hmm. And again, I've seen it happen quite a bit where adults coddle them and treat them Mm -hmm. like crying is a reason why they must be right about something. Right. Well, you know, I've been uh, married, uh, since for, for about, for a good eight years now. And I've known my wife before that. Right. And all this time she cried once. Yeah. It's not a typical thing for her. It's like, a so, so I kind of come, you know, I'm, I don't know how well I would have tolerated someone who would cry like very easily, I suppose, you know, like, uh, yeah. So, my my own life experience tends to be really different. Um, yeah. I don't re- yeah I don't respond well to crying too much. I'm kind of like, what the hell are you crying about? <laughs> if, 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 I'm not talk, talking about my wife. I'm talking about women who do cry in general. Oh yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, um, yeah. Um, so 
Is there a point, because, you know, a, a lot of people on the right say men are pathetic if they cry or something like that, but is there a right time for men to cry? Well, I'll, I'll give you another story for this one. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we love your stories. My, uh, so my generation, like one of our most iconic childhood experiences was when the movie E.T. was in the theaters. Huh? Like you're you're Gen Xer, aren't you? Uh, or are you younger than me? I'm I'm 34. Oh, okay. I was born. Yeah. What does that make me again? I'm, I think that I'm makes all... you a millennial. <laughs> yeah, at least like the... you're not a Zoomer yeah. though. <laughs> not yeah, not a Zoomer. I think I am a millennial. Yeah, yeah that makes I'm... you a millennial. My um, but... my older stepdaughter is actually about your age. Yeah. So, so... Uh, yeah, I think I'm so... one of the last of the millennials, I think. Yeah, you might be yeah, it just yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty close. My uh, my youngest, my son, is a Zoomer, um, but my two daughters are considered millennials, and mm-hmm. uh, so my son acts like a, a millennial. He doesn't act like a Zoomer, although he acts like a millennial that is closer to Gen X than millennial. So it's kind of yeah, he understands things that other kids his age. I say kids, he's mm-hmm. like. He's a quarter right. of a century old. I can't call him a kid anymore. <laughs> right, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he understands things that other Zoomers never understood. And uh, I think a lot of it is because we didn't raise him the way that a lot of G- Gen Xers yeah. did a bad job on with a lot of things in child rearing. Because um, they were trying to make up for some of the dumb things that boomers did. Um, and I, I didn't have a lot of those dumb things. Like we never got grounded. Uh, and we never, we didn't really get spanked either. We we got, we got taught what was the right way to do things through helping us understand the moral and ethical yeah. aspects of it. Yeah. I mean, like our parents were teachers, my brother and me. Um, but the story is, so we went to see E.T. And you know the scene when E.T. dies and so, yeah. then he comes back to life. Yeah, it's it's an old movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird thing saying that, but <laughs> um, and I was I was in elementary school when it came out. I think I think that came out in 1982 or 85, somewhere in there. But ET dies, you know, and it's all it's it's very dramatic and traumatic, and Elliot is heartbroken and and he's you know he doesn't know what to do and he's walking yeah. away and then. The flowers bloom. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. And that's yeah. how you know E.T.'s not dead. Mm-hmm. And at that moment, like, even just talking about that moment in that movie makes me want to cry because it hit so hard when that when you saw that movie for the first time in the theater. And uh, I, I remember fighting so hard to not cry because why would I cry in the theater over a movie? I'm not right. injured, right? And I look over... And my dad just has tears streaming down his face, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Tears can tears don't just mean sadness or anger right. or pain or suffering. You cry because you're compassionate. You cry because you're overwhelmed with emotion. And right. we treat men like they should never be. They should never feel so overwhelmed with emotion that they have a physical response. Right. Well, that's bullshit. It's always been bullshit. There are times when it's mentioned in the Bible where men are so overwhelmed with emotion mm-hmm. that they cry, right? right. Yeah. Jesus cried. Sure. Right. There are times when that's okay. So when is it okay? When you can't help it. There's nothing wrong with not being able to help it. And when it's okay for you, when you feel like it's okay, it's the right thing for you to do in the moment. And, and – it's it's not okay for men or women to whine, right? It's not okay right. for men or women to use tears to manipulate other people. Right, right. But it's like asking when it's okay to laugh. If something is funny, it's okay to laugh. Hmm. If you're happy, it's okay to laugh. And so it's stupid to say, but that doesn't apply to crying. Right. Of course it applies to crying. Mm-hmm. 
Does that mean that some guys are going to do it more than others? Well, some women do it more than others. So why would there be one set, only one, you know, size fits all way for guys to do it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember, uh, uh, that video of the guy who recorded himself, the, the Starbucks employee that was whining about working long hours, I think it was. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's manipulative stuff like that too. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that I understand. Kind of, uh, well, and I think Starbucks, they were trying to unionize when they, that happened. And he was, he was, there's, there, there's some fairness in complaining about what it's like to work in food service. Cause it does kind of suck. Well, sh- well, true. Yeah. But I've worked in uh, retail establishments that were unionized. And I mean, I grew up with uh, four uncles who were truck drivers. I understand what unions are supposed to do. And the, 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 I will just say the union for retail workers is definitely not the Teamsters. Um, I have no respect for the retail union whatsoever. They suck. They don't do anything for the workers. They just take your money and they give it to politicians. And when you need them, they are not there. Right. And that's absolutely the exact polar opposite of what I saw my uncle's experience with the Teamsters. They were a family. And that's the way a union should be. I'm not anti-union. I'm not pro-union. But, but I will say sure. if a union is going to exist, it definitely should take care of the workers first. Yeah. That's what they are there for. That's their job. And uh, so I, I feel bad for Starbucks workers if they thought unionizing was going to solve their problems because right. their union isn't any better. My understanding from other food service workers that have worked in unionized places is that it's about as effective as the retail unions. Yeah. They don't do jack. Mm-hmm. Right. Back to crying. Um, so you know what Super Sentai is, right? No, I missed part of that. You said uh, you know what? Oh, uh, uh yeah. Do you know what Super Sentai is? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so I've been amassing a good collection of those. And, like, you know, you can't for a second argue that the men in, in the, the, the male characters are, are anything but masculine, right? Right. And, and, you know, depending on the situation, they cry hard. You know, yeah. I mean... I mean, compared to Power Rangers, you know, uh, some of the storylines are much more tragic. But, you know, like uh, in Die Ranger, like the the most the, the toughest guy had the loudest cry. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah. Right. So I I can't you know to see that crying is unmasculine is strange to me. You know. Yeah. It, yeah. So. Uh, well, here's here's the the very basic way I would put it. People shouldn't be telling men when to cry and how to cry, when to express themselves and how to express themselves. Mm -hmm. It is what's what I see as masculine in terms of emotional expression is as opposed to uh, feminine. And and this is. This is just from me growing up around almost entirely boys not very many girls. So everything I learned about being female came from adult women and women that were much, you know, girls that were teenagers by the time I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. The girls that would come in and babysit, right? I see men only crying when there is really a reason to cry. Either they are crying for somebody else's pain, they are crying for... Uh, a deep loss or they are crying because something has happened that has um, because they're cavelling basically (laughs) except um, not always happy you know sometimes it's it's just so big that that that's the only way that it can come out is that their their body has this crying response Mm -hmm. and it's it's not something that um, there should be any shame in that but at the same time, it's not something that you can command them to do, and they do it. That's not okay either. Right. Whereas I, I noticed that women 
are have more of a tendency to cry at the drop of a hat, mm-hmm. especially if they really like that hat. <laughs> really bad joke, but that's the, the, yeah. the, the, like that's minor losses can make women teary eyed. Women will cry because they're frustrated. I that's one of mine. If I, I'm really frustrated about something, I have to fight tears on top of all of the other aspects of dealing with it. Um, but uh, we'll cry more easily than men. We'll cry for smaller reasons than men, and we'll cry when we really don't have a reason and and it feels silly to do it um and and uh i think some of it is the difference in um tear duct development that that, that, like karen talks about that she's a good person to ask about that there's an actual biological change that takes place between childhood and adulthood in men that doesn't happen in women um but yeah, I don't think people should be telling men that they have to cry, mm-hmm. and I don't think that people should be telling men that, that it's shameful when they respond to a reason to cry by crying. Right. What's shameful is that uh, people who don't fully grow up will make that their primary response as opposed to um, dealing with the situation but expressing the the emotions that are happening yeah. in the moment, you know? Right. Like, it's just like with anger. You get mad, and, and sometimes when you're really mad, your voice goes up, right? You get louder. And there are some people who raise their voice when they can't help it or when they they feel like it's really important for what they're saying to be heard, and it's more important than any of the other things that are trying to be heard in a moment, whether it's somebody else's voice or uh, the, the loudness of uh, the environment or whatever um and and yelling in anger is not an abnormal reaction to being angry yelling in anger is is just a form of emotional expression just like any other form of emotional expression Uh, but men don't get away with it as much as women do because they're bigger and stronger and scarier and uh men have men are more mindful about that potential for scaring the people around them and getting in trouble for it because of that. And so men take more control over how they yell and uh, how frequently they yell, how loud they yell, how they use their their dad voice, right, Mm -hmm. or their angry voice because Mm -hmm. it can get them into trouble. Women should be that way with crying. Yeah. And we're not. Yeah, I, I, I'm not willing to say it's so intrinsic to womanhood that they can't help it. You know, I think th- they can be held accountable for that one. So maybe they should be. Yeah, we we can. We can. We can help it. I just recently had to deal with that at work. So in 2019, I was assaulted by a coworker. Um, and okay. now if I was a if I was a jerk, there is a social cred that comes with that. Um, this was a stupid situation, too. Okay. It involved passing a medication that is easy to pass. It is the easiest medication on our list to pass. The least amount of effort is involved, um, and it's the, the only reason she didn't want to pass that med was because if she made it so that I had to pass that med, uh, the med has to be passed after a series of other things, other tasks get done. And so that would mean I would have to do all of those other tasks. But those tasks are involved in the client getting up and getting ready for their day. So on Saturdays, you're allowed to sleep in. You don't have to go to work. You don't have to go to a day program. You don't have any place that you have to be. Any Mm -hmm. normal person chooses to sleep in on that day if they want to. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a right that the client has they get to choose whether they're going to get up early in the morning or not just because they're they got a disability doesn't mean they lose that right so she would get mad every time the client would choose to sleep in and she would have to pass that med and uh she kept ordering me to do it or sign that the client refused even though there was still time at the beginning of her shift where the client was allowed to have that med Mm -hmm. and and it was a med that you could and uh, at, at any other house, they regularly did 
have it outside the two hour window. It wasn't something you could overdose on. It was a, uh, you know, hygienic thing. Like you, if you were putting uh, lotion on your skin or using shampoo, special shampoo or using a mouthwash or toothpaste that was special or anything like that, um, you wouldn't have to worry that, you know, you were showering three hours later in a day than normal. Mm-hmm. It's you still use it. Right. So it's right. something like that. Um, and so one day she came in and he had chosen to sleep in and the med was not passed and, uh, she demanded that I take care of the situation for her. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I was like, look, the manager gave us instructions. This is what the instructions were. If you want me to do something different, you have to talk to her. I am following the manager's instructions. Got it. Which is what you do at work. Yeah. And I went to leave and she ran around in front of me and wouldn't let me out. Wow. And then when I went to grab the door handle and open it and leave anyway, she grabbed me and shoved me back, threw me up against the wall and started punching me in the face. And this is this is not Waffle House. This <laughs> is not Taco Bell, right? Mm-hmm. It's not where, where an employee takes somebody in the back parking lot and then beats them down. I'm not working at a bar. This is a medical environment mm-hmm. in somebody else's home. So we're not just employees for the company that we're working for. We are also guests in the home of an individual who needs us to be there because of vulnerabilities the individual has. And this woman is behaving this way. And so in the moment, I was just completely shocked. Like I hadn't been my last get into a fight type experience. I was under age and I was 48 when this happened. Like I was way grown out of that years and years earlier, didn't have any kind of inclination. And and she did that. And I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. So for the first second of it, the first full second of it, I just didn't react at all. And then when I did start to react, I realized that she was she was half my age. She was uh, okay. stronger than me. She was faster than me. And there's two ways to fight with somebody like that, right? One is to lose. And the other one is if you have been in a lot of fights and you know how to lash out and do significant damage to somebody, you hurt mm-hmm. them really bad. Because um, in, in my situation... I wasn't in the position of being the bigger, stronger, faster person. I was only the smarter person. Well, my assessment of the situation was that the only things that she had left vulnerable were her knees. And uh, yeah. I, she threw me on the ground. And in the second, in a split second, I had this thought. I could, I could hear her knee breaking. I had big, heavy work boots on because Mm -hmm. that's what I was comfortable wearing at the time. Mm -hmm. And I could have, she, she left them completely unprotected. She wasn't paying any attention at all below the waist other than to try to target my face with, with her fists. Mm -hmm. And then I, I pictured like here she is in her twenties and I break her knee out sideways. That is never going to get better. It's, it'll get, somewhat better but it's never going to heal fully she's never Mm going to walk the same she's never going to work the same it's far worse than what she was doing to me and i couldn't bring myself to do it so i told her i was going to call the cops i hoped that that would scare the crap out of her she ran over and clocked back out and fled the scene so -hmm. she basically legally abandoned the client right yeah the, the cops get there and to make matters worse, she was this cute little kittenish looking thing. Yeah. And I'm yeah. I look like that guy from Metalopolis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the cop uh, looks which, at me which and one? looks at uh, murder murder phase? Was it uh, I I'm, I can't think of his uh, name, but he's the guy with the long black hair that's the leader Nathan, of the Nathan group. Nathan Explosion. Nathan yes, Explosion. Nathan Explosion. <laughs> I look like Nathan Explosion. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but I, I, I do. I just look a little, little slight bit girlier than him, but um, you know, because he doesn't look twi- girly. No, I'm the professional smartass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
No, I, I, I might sometime use it as my Twitter profile picture and see if yeah, people, yeah, that's what people I meant. get that's it. What I meant. Ah, yeah, that I might do. I mean, that's a honey badger from anyway. right now. The already can see you for a man anyway. So. <laughs> it's funny. If you took um, Nathan Explosion and that chick from the ring, Samara, and they had a baby together, <laughs> when, I get, <laughs> when I'm upset, uh-huh. that's kind of like I have murder eyes. You know, everybody else talks about resting bitch face, but I got rest serial killer face when I'm mad Uh um so and and I was very upset and I've been a trauma victim enough times and I'm autistic and I didn't know it at the time but I've been a trauma victim enough times that I don't like you could put me through hell and that might not make me cry right you could put I could I could be you could set me on fire and I might not cry um Uh but uh well I have been on (laughs) <laughs> I got third degree burns on my foot when I was five and it was my fault. I stuck my foot in hot coals. That was a dumb thing to do, but, uh, I was five. So yeah. I, I plead, uh, uh, ignorance at the time, incompetence, but in any way, <laughs> yeah. so the cop took her side. Of course. Of course it and I, I had a concussion and I had, um, I had to go through physical therapy and everything after the the assault i was off for like a month it was not fun and i had to raise money for a defense because the cops cited us both for disorderly conduct and i was not going to have a criminal record um so that all happened and that was in 2019 so i get into a conflict at work um not too long ago over uh, another employee just was not doing her job mm-hmm. and it was all falling on me. I was end up having to do my chores and her chores and I wasn't keeping up And the, I kept ex- explaining to the manager, like I can do all of my stuff. I can get all of my stuff done, but there are things that she is leaving undone that I can't do my tasks until I get those tasks done. Like I can't, vacuum the carpet until i get the junk that she left all over the floor off of it you know so it's not just well i can't just ignore that she didn't do her job and do mine i have to do both um because that's the you can't you know i can't cook if the dishes are dirty i have to clean the dishes to use them you know that kind of thing right and so we finally get that solved and she goes crying to another coworker who then started a conflict uh, over me being a prima donna and when she couldn't get her way she left so there was this whole three in a row series of first there was the crazy woman and you have to be crazy to be working in a medical environment and act like that then there was the lazy woman and then there was the the uh, biased the in-group biased woman who decided that I must be a bully. So that's all done and over with in 2022. And as all of this is going on, and at the end of 2020, my mom got COVID and she passed away in early 2021. And then my dad got the vaccine because mom died from COVID and the vaccine wrecked his kidneys and he died at the end of 2021. So I lost both of my parents in 2021 while all this is going on. So about a month ago, the conclusion of this is I had a coworker that is new. She's a Zoomer. There's a lot of things that she doesn't know how to do that Gen Xers knew how to do by the time we were her age. And it's just a slow process of you know, rounding out her learning curve, I guess would be the way to there's just stuff that, you know, it's not her fault. She doesn't know how to do it. She didn't willfully not learn how to do these things, but, um, and, and she's, she's doing the work of learning the work. So yeah. it's not like there's anything wrong with that situation. But my manager got fed up and she felt like, uh, some things had been unreasonably done to me or left for me. Uh, and I had to, I, you know, in the, in the moment, um, I had not gotten some things done that I should have gotten done. And, and it was largely because I let myself get distracted working on things that could have been left for later that just bugged me. 
Um, mm-hmm. Cause I could get a little OCD about cleaning and I could have used all of that cred. Oh yes. I'm the victim in the situation. This woman is dumping her, her uh, tasks on me and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and of course I didn't, I had to explain to my manager, this is not her fault. She's not being mean to me. She's not being lazy. I screwed up. I, I'm the one that caused this problem. This is my fault. Um, and she just did not expect that from me because she had identified me. We had a manager switch while all this was going on, by the way. Okay. So she had identified me as the, the cause of the trouble because all the drama was centered around me. And when I, when I did that, like I could see the, the gears turning. Why isn't she whining about this? Why isn't she taking the opportunity? Why is she telling me it's her fault? (laughs) So the next time I talked to her about stuff like that, she was a little more open and um, I got a little more respect for my opinions and everything. But it's just that whole thing. Men sort of automatically do what I did in the moment most of the time. In my experience working with men, they will own up to something if it's their fault. They don't blame the next person. When they do, all the other guys don't like them. Mm-hmm. But most girls I've worked with, if they have that kind of cred where – and I, I say cred. It's like a currency. You have victim cred. Mm-hmm. I have victim yeah. cred at work. I don't like it. I don't want it, and I'm not going to spend it. But you can spend it to get – power over other people and it works right. it's very effective um it's it can screw up your whole work environment mm-hmm. and it it loses you everybody's respect if you spend it so the cost for the trade off is you're also spending your respect points um yeah. men men understand that and mm-hmm. women don't so i i guess when it goes back to the whole crying and the expressing of feelings and everything and uh, what you tell people as adults and everything, an adult understands not to abuse their victim cred, not to abuse their vulnerability cred. They don't spend their respect points on controlling other people. They build respect points and they use those respect points very sparingly to help people understand their perspective on something when they know that it's going to be valued because they have the respect and it makes a big difference in how uh, smoothly and efficiently and effectively a workplace runs. And unfortunately, I think that's part of the reason why the unions don't work in um, retail establishments and stuff too, because those are female dominated bottom rungs. And, you know, I think that that abuse takes place and that failure to understand how respect works takes place in those environments gotcha so it was a long story but the point oh. the point sort of goes right back to that whole um an adult understands to express their emotions to help people understand their perspective mm-hmm. a child who never grows up uses their emotions to manipulate people Right. And men understand that, and women unfortunately don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so much for the more civilized sex, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gonna backtrack just a little bit. So you you mentioned that you kind of grew up in a girl desert, uh, not enough girls, that kind of thing. Yeah. So hypothetical. Um, what would a boy do in a boy desert? Uh, uh how uh how would he kind of overcome that? Is there like uh uh I don't assume there's any kind of good that comes out of being in a boy desert in this situation. There can be. My grandpa kind of grew up like that. He had, um, okay. he was the oldest boy in his family, and he was the middle kid. So okay. all of the kids that were older than him and his family were sisters. Okay. And, uh, you know, he w- then he was, uh, his brothers were all much younger than him. So he he had a lot of exposure to female behavior before he had exposure to male behavior his father was uh murdered by the mafia um for for a relationship 
he cheated on his wife and on my great grandmother with uh mafia princess and uh, so oh. he was run over by a taxi while he was getting onto a bus so the taxi literally went up on the sidewalk and the only person who got hit was my great grandfather um and then in, without admitting any fault or you know anything because there were even though there was a crowd of people waiting to get on the bus nobody saw it happen um they 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 paid my great grandmother a regular stipend every month for the rest of her life after that so that sort of tells you even the, even the mafia takes more responsibility than corporations um but they, they still you know they still murdered a guy for who he was sleeping with but uh, in any case so my my grandpa had um he grew up somewhat with his dad but he had very little influence from his dad um what he ended up being he was very capable in terms of salesmanship mm -hmm. he was very good at public speaking polar opposite of me I, I you put me on a stage you're gonna see deer in the headlights i'm right. i'm terrified up there but my grandpa was like that was his home get up on a stage you know or uh get in with a group of people where there's a point that he wants to persuade them on. Mm -hmm. He could have been the absolute perfect lawyer because he had, he had the logic of a man, but he also had the emotional manipulative capabilities of a woman mm -hmm. and he knew it and he knew how he could do it. So my grandparents started um, a, a facility, a medical facility for children with disabilities when uh they were they were in like their 40s and they had not originally intended to start a facility they were just going to help a neighbor and then another neighbor needed help and then another neighbor and then pretty soon people from further away started hearing about these people that would help and all of a sudden they realized the size of the need that existed at the time was well beyond something that they could just do from out of their home and they actually needed to build a facility and they needed to hire people and create a place in a business that would help people in a circumstance where their children had uh, such medical, special medical needs that they couldn't just keep track of their, their medical needs in the home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was raising money. And he, he was able to figure out with each, uh, each entity that he went to talk to how to talk to them in a way to personalize the situation like there was a story that my grandmother used to tell about grandpa going in and talking to a man who was uh, very very well healed like millionaire or something like that that he was asking for a donation and um, the reasons that he was giving for what we can do for the children if we have this money what we're going to do how what's going to be earmarked for what that will accomplish in their lives and so on but then he also looked around the room he was in and every wall had bookshelves and every bookshelf was full and he started talking about the individual children and their individual needs and when he he made a note in his head of that at one point in the conversation he told the guy most of these children will never learn to read and you know me talking about um men cry when they're emotionally overwhelmed by something or they cry when they're hurting for somebody else's pain like that guy his tears just streamed down in that moment mm -hmm. you know like grandpa made the situation his situation right. it was his problem now that these kids needed help and so he did he helped and they were able to build there was a thing that that their facility pioneered um there's a uh, they sensitize it, they now they use a sensory room so there's like different colored lights different textured objects and stuff like that where interaction with these things can help increase the brain activity of small children and mm -hmm. Even people with extreme intellectual disabilities, their, their brain has more plasticity in infancy and youth than in adulthood. 
And so whatever their potential is that, you know, you can stretch your potential and have more capabilities within your life. Maybe it takes you from being unable to communicate with people to having some form of communication so that when you need something, you can ask for it. Yeah. Or maybe it takes you from being almost but not quite able to hold a job and earn some money and buy things you want to being able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's just a little bit of uh, increase in intellectual capabilities and in uh, communication capabilities and, and stuff like that. So they end up funding things like that with that money. And um, it, it connected for that guy in that moment. Um, but it was emotional manipulation and, uh, you know, it, it was, it was one of those things that a lot of guys, they can give you all of the logic in the world for why this is a good idea, but it, it doesn't always click with people, the emotional end of it, unless they touch on that one individual this is this is a way that you can personally identify with that, and uh, so that's something that a guy that's raised in somewhat of a of man desert can get, but it can only happen. You know, my, my dad, um, his dad wasn't there, uh, and his mom was. He does the same thing. Um, he he doesn't he was never emotionally manipulative in a exploitative kind of way the way that women were but he got me fired up for cross country running by emotionally manipulating me mm-hmm. and cross country running was hard as hell for me cuz my asthma was really profoundly bad they didn't right. think i was going to live to be 21 the doctor mm-hmm. said if something doesn't change you know you guys need to buy a burial plan and my dad wasn't having that, you know, right. I mean, he, sure. my old country doctor, you know, was, was all about, let's try this, let's try whatever we can. So getting me into cross country was an effort at preserving my life and it worked. I'm alive now because I did that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, emotional manipulation with men is getting you psyched up, getting you um, inspiring you basically. inspired to do yeah. something. Yeah, um, recognizing my gym teacher used to do the opposite, right? I uh, mm-hmm. he he was still emotionally manipulating me to be active. Mm-hmm. I would get wimpy for a minute in gym class, and he would say to me, "It's all right, and you can sit this one out. It's uh, we understand, you know." And and I would be like, "Uh uh-uh, uh, I can do this." Reverse you know. psychology, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was really good at it. He was a football coach, so he was really good at it. And uh, he was a great coach. He was on a team with um, several great coaches with a leader who is revered in our community for what a great coach he was. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, uh, it it's... So men do pick up on um, things that women do that can be used as tools. And for the most part, unless they develop dysfunctional behaviors because of other issues that happen when they're growing up, they use them as ways to build community and build up the people around them, protect and preserve. And and again, those are both um, just entirely, I suppose it can be considered sexist, but men uh find tools in in their lives in, in everything around yeah. them and use those tools to achieve positive outcomes for themselves and the people that they are protecting and preserving and and nurturing and taking care of right you know it's interesting like when, so we're going to the subject of using tools like it seems to me that, you know, you would think, you know, you and I would think that, you know, tool, you know, using tools is such a manly thing, but a lot of the anti-male, like, I don't mean anti-male, but like, uh, any kind of male shaming that happens from, from, from some people, um, but calling them unmanly or so forth is that if they use any kind of aid or, 
assistance or tools or technology, they're less of a man than if they did something more with their bare hands or taking more toil because of it. You kind of understand what, I, what I'm getting yes, at? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah, right. And, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's a functional and dysfunctional level to that, right? The functional level is valuing um, the the conclusions, the benefits from hard work when hard work is necessary. Like you've got a pile of rocks to move and all you have is your hands and a shovel and a wheelbarrow. So you have to use your hands to pick up the bigger rocks and you have to use the shovel to get the smaller rocks because you don't have another tool, right? right. And there's nothing shameful or wrong about that. That person is not beneath people who are uh, who have, have put themselves in a situation where they don't have to do that, um, that hard work can strengthen and toughen you. But at the same time, acting as though your brain isn't the same situation where, you know, oh, let's say you figure out you can tip the wheelbarrow to the ground and push instead of lifting and a large number of the rocks will end up in it. And then you, you just figured out how to get your rocks moved with a little less work, right? There is no shame in that. That's not wrong. That's not bad. And uh, finding out, figuring out safer, less labor intensive, easier ways to get a job done. That's as long as you're not putting your work off onto somebody else is admirable. And it always should be. Or similarly, if you're injured and you can't lift the rocks, but you figure out, you know, that you can you can take one of the rocks and use it as a fulcrum to make your shovel a lever to get rocks into, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, even if it takes you longer to get it done. You know, or or if you hire somebody to do the task because you can't, there's nothing wrong with that, even if it means you're not the one getting it done. Those are all money is a tool. Mm -hmm. It is. Everything is a tool. So there's there's nothing shameful about doing the hard work if you don't have another way to do it. But there's also nothing shameful about accommodating injuries or weaknesses. There's nothing shameful about recognizing uh, the, the that there are some limitations that are unwise to try to, to bypass. You know, if your injury is a back injury, you can't just ignore it because you make it worse. You can lose your ability to walk. Um, You know, so different things like that. Men in general are pretty good at figuring out the difference between doing something the hard way for the sake of doing it the hard way and being stupid about it and then doing something the hard way because the easy way has just been denied to you. Mm-hmm. Where I think a lot of women, um, I think a lot of women just look for ways to shame men about it, and I think that yeah. men who, who are gynocentric, who listen to those women, go along with it. Yeah, that that seems to be the case. Like more to the point, um, like what's his name? Like Nick Offerman, I think it was the guy who played the uh uh. The caricature of a libertarian in a parks and recreation. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I mean, in real life, this guy is like a like some some liberal guy, right? And and I think he had he made some kind of you know anti gun remark, saying that you know if you're a real man, you wouldn't use guns. So well, that's and that's dumb. yeah yeah it is dumb yeah but um but the idea uh, and I'm pretty sure it was him that said that but. Um, but that kind of plays more into the into the point I was making is that you know if you use a tool you're a loser or something or and so forth. I um I used to photograph I used to photograph uh, sports for my local newspaper mm-hmm. um, when I was an, in high school. My first paying job outside of the family mm-hmm. was uh, being a stringer, and I would go photograph golf and and basketball volleyball you know track and cross country and when i was running i'd also um take pictures of the other races so in between you know i would have a my my camera in my gym bag um but uh i one of my favorite things to photograph was football 
Mm. And I, I loved being on the sidelines for the football games. I loved the environment and I loved the sport, um, everything about it. Right. And for the Europeans, I'm talking about American football. Uh, but uh, so similar to you, but not quite the same as uh, English rugby. Uh, mm. And um, there are some things that you use a wide angle lens for because you can be somewhat up close like if you're taking pictures of people on the sidelines doing their their things, a coach talking to a player, a uh, sports medicine uh, worker helping the player. I can't think of the term. The therapist helping the player yeah. that sprained an ankle or something. You, that's OK. Right. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to be six feet away from the guys on the field. So you need a telephoto lens mm-hmm. and uh, it would be stupid to come along and say, well, the real man uses a wide angle lens for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And get yourself in there. It doesn't matter if you get hit. Um, having been having been run over once on the field, I can yep. say that it matters quite a bit. And yeah. even the way the teams played uh, was was different. Actually, that kind of brings that up. I was used to photographing the the St. Mary's Rough Riders football team, yep. and that during my high school time. That team didn't have to throw the ball ever. Like mm-hmm. they did it sometimes, but it was a rare thing. They just ran over everybody. They were mm-hmm. big, uh, corn fed farm boys that loved football, that they played football as a pastime from the time they were little kids um, mm-hmm. until they were in high school. In fact, I played football with some of those guys at the park, Sandlot football, as a little kid, till. We got to the age where the boys started outpacing the girls in, in physical growth, and then I couldn't do that anymore because they were serious when they played. Yeah. And uh, that, that they were a lot bigger than me at that point. So that wasn't smart to continue playing with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in any case, so they uh, they didn't have to throw the ball. And the, the time that I got hit, I was photographing the Minster team. God, I can't think of their name. That's really bad. Um, anyway, Minster Minster was a uh, different shape of guys. They were tall, and they were muscular, and they weren't lightweights, but they were tall, they were slim, and they had good a lot of them had good throwing arms. So, so they ran a passing game, and I wasn't expecting it. And so I'm I'm way upfield thinking that they're going to cuz they'd had a really good season, they're going to run in my direction and I could get a whole series of shots. Uh, and, and all of a sudden the guy has the ball in his hand turns and he brings the ball back behind his head and he's got his other arm forward while he's running and he's facing me. And I'm like, what the, oh crap. And as soon as I had that series of thoughts, the guy that was supposed to catch the ball, the guy that was supposed to stop him, the guy that was supposed to stop that guy and the guy that was supposed to stop that guy all hit me at once. They all went off sides and <laughs> hit me at once. And uh, that was just awful. So uh, uh-huh. I, I learned to pay attention to the teams that had a throwing game too. But nobody comes along and says that the team that was really good at passing way down, you know, or way up field uh-huh. um, was any less manly than the boys that ran over the other players. Right. Uh, they they had a tool. They mm-hmm. could launch that ball for yards and yards and yards, and the other guy usually would catch it. Right. The the, the right. receiver would catch it, and that's how they were beating everybody. Like the other other teams couldn't catch up or couldn't predict. Um, they could throw farther than the other teams could, and uh, they made progress to to uh, the end zone much faster that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was much less of a grind, actually, in, in that game. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, you got to pay attention. And mm-hmm. uh, it's it's dumb for people to say, well, this is the way I do it. So you can't use the tool you have uh, and mm-hmm. you're using because it makes you unmanly. Uh, right, your yeah. brain is a tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Use it. Yeah. And, and in fact... Um, I really wish, uh, speaking for, for our own movement here, we make much more and more and more emphasis on men's brains because uh, that's uh, that's a 
big part of their masculinity, I think, because everybody talks about the labor and the protection and the provision and so forth. But I kind of want to talk about talk more about their geniuses and, and such the, and, and in their own particular ways. I, w- I wish I wish there was more of that. I think. Men's brains gave us the single most important invention for the um, the health of civilization of all time. And people act like it's something gross to be ashamed of when, in fact, men's brains, men's engineering, men's expansion and improvement on it, and men's willingness to do dirty, filthy, nasty, disgusting jobs to maintain it um, are the reason that we don't have cholera epidemics and Mm -hmm. E. coli epidemics. And all kinds of nastiness uh, in terms of bacteria, fungus, and viruses in our communities. And, and it's one of the most humble inventions of all time as well. And feminists tried to use it to shame men on International Men's Day by pointing out that it also happens to be World Toilet Day. Well, hell yeah, it should be World Toilet Day. Without toilets invented by men. And indoor plumbing invented by men and sewer systems invented by men. Y'all would be sicker than dogs trying to live in cities with hundreds of thousands or millions of people in them. Like, what the hell? How stupid and short-sighted for women to get all hoity-toity and looking down on men. Look, today's World Toilet Day and International Men Day. Well, yeah, we have toilets. Thank God for men. Right, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, men's brains are pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Right, At least yeah. I think so. <laughs> Women's yeah. brains are like, Beavis, this sucks, change it. <laughs> and and men, yeah. men's brains are like, okay, how are we going to do that? All right, we could do this, and we have to make these things happen, and here's a way to engineer it, and it's going to take this much work, and here's a time frame on how we're going to get it done, and here's what we got to do to maintain it, and all right, will will these these guys are willing to get their hands dirty maintaining it and the whole time women are like oh my god look at that guy his clothes are dirty his boots are dirty his shoes are dirty oh my god look at that international men's day is on toilet day oh my god you know thanks maybe a little bit of thanks <laughs> right mm-hmm. yeah I don't know. indeed yeah it's not that women's brains are not useful. You know, we figure things out too. But for God's sake, you know, looking down on men's brains is belligerently stupid. Yeah, for sure. I mean, speaking of like the different brains between the two sexes, you know, it's kind of the, the subject that I've always thought funny was, you know, I suppose in terms of physicality, I, th- there's an understanding about why. Men have their own sports and women have their own. But women's chess uh, is where I kind of start to kind of like, I, I re- if our brains are supposed to be equal, do we really need this? Uh, that's something I didn't kind of ponder yeah. over. Yeah, but may- maybe men are just more competitive. Is, is that's, that's the counter argument that comes keeps coming up. It's not uh, that men are more competitive. Right, um, yeah. Consistently at least historically, consistently on IQ tests, there are areas in which each sex outperforms the other. Mm-hmm. And women, women seem to do, this is, this is one of the areas where this is one of the reasons I think why I get Twitter sex changes <laughs> every day. Because <laughs> right. um, I'm supposed to think one way because I'm female and I end up thinking another way and it doesn't other women don't know how to identify with that but consistently not necessarily universally but consistently men outperform women in testing on understanding and uh, doing logic functions around spatial relationships so like if you've ever taken an IQ test, they give you something that looks like uh, they took the squares from a Rubik's Cube and they, they put them in a shape. Mm-hmm. And 
you're supposed to look at four other examples of what that shape would look like at another angle. And one of them is correct and the other three are wrong. And you pick out the one that's right. And men are better at that than women. Mm -hmm. Um, Similarly, if you take a string of numbers and you uh, ask an individual to remember that string of numbers, um, men outperform women on that as well. How many numbers they get in their string before they lose track and uh, how many numbers they get in their string before they stop being able to say it backward and stuff like that. Mm. So in a game where spatial relationships matter because some of the pieces can only move in certain directions and some of the pieces can only move so many squares and, and so on. And being able to track what will happen if you move this direction, where your vulnerabilities are. So strategy, basically, in, in, in terms of the mechanics of the game. Um, what can this person do if I do this? That men are better at that. Right. Now, if you throw in social situations, emotional manipulation, um, if you throw in if, like people's uh, the way people react psychologically to to certain behaviors and so on, um, women have the advantage there, and they mm-hmm. outperform men on a regular basis. And the, the, the functional aspect of that is that it usually you usually see women being the one planning the family social events and how everything is going to go be done to provide comfort and a, a happy environment for um, family fellowship and camaraderie and bonding and so on. Yeah. Um, usually the, what the ladies will be like, we're going to do it on this day and we're going to do it at this, this person's house and we should have these kinds of foods and and it doesn't mean that the the men aren't involved in that at all but a lot of those traditions are kind of run by women Mm -hmm. um but uh the dysfunctional aspect of it is when a woman goes to divorce her husband and she falsely accuses him of abusing her or the children and she manipulates the entire legal system and the court system and She's always six or seven steps ahead of him because he has no understanding of what she's going to do without some sort of a roadmap from other guys that have been through this. Right. And uh, I've I've seen women just absolutely pulverize men like they're going through a meat grinder um, using those tools as weapons. So, uh, you know, it's. They may not have, I don't think women are equal to men in terms of their capabilities regarding chess. But I do Mm. think, um, I do think that uh, women have an equal strength and capability. And they they do have the ability to abuse it in equally devastating ways. Like where chess is a metaphor for war in Mm. a, a way of handling things you might handle in war with a game instead um you know like women it's the same way with women and the whole socialization thing that i suck at um you know i can talk about women being good at that but i'm not one of the women that's that's not the biggest tool in my toolbox mm-hmm. um so uh which is why i got the diagnosis that and the four genetic markers uh, um, but yeah, um, mm-hmm. then, and you can tell when it's lacking in a woman because she ends up bashing heads with other women on a regular basis because of it, mm-hmm. you know, not knowing yeah. the rules and all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, speaking of putting men through the meat grinder, it seems like, you know, uh, a lot of women just kind of get off on male pain. I mean, I know we've spoken uh, a little about this before, you know, off the record and, and such, but yeah. you know, like, uh, yeah, like, you know, they downright sadistic sometimes uh, in their tastes and men too. Cause you know, like, like 
for example, like one thing I hear a lot is scars are sexy, you know, and you know, like it's like damage and having almost being brought to death is an attractive romantic quality to them, you know, and it's like you know, it's kind of coming across as if the more damaged a man is and the more broken he is, the more attractive uh, he may be to her, and I'd hate to think that's true, you know, uh, uh, but you know, it's like it's hard to kind of suspect women of being uh, anything but that. Yeah. There are, there are women that are very much like that and there are women that aren't right. Um, But there are women who, and, and some of this might be because of practical applications that that they're approaching in an incredibly malicious and dysfunctional way. Uh But uh, I mean, a guy that's, that's, um, willing to obtain scars in pursuit of a goal, that means that's a guy that's going to be reliable. If he's willing to obtain, sc- obtain scars, if he can't get the goal without obtaining the scars, um, that's, that's, there is something to be said for that being reliable. And so... If a woman is looking for a man that she wants to depend on, she may find Scars attractive because that's a guy who's incredibly determined and tough and strong and so on. And she might not be thinking past that. But if you love someone, you don't want them to get hurt. Like that's that's a fundamental aspect of love is being invested in the welfare of the person who is the target of your emotion. And right. so you don't want a guy to get scarred. You don't want him to be injured, wounded, uh, suffering. You want to be the person that is his warm, safe place where he doesn't have to think about those things and deal with those things. Okay. And um, so it, it's, I think a lot of times people tell men that chicks did digs scars yeah for them to uh, you know be more determined and be more willing to to um work at something that's hard or dirty or painful or whatever um where sometimes they're they should have a different motivation instead and at the same time they tell people chicks did dig scars because they don't want a man to feel unattractive because he has them and most guys, guys are more high risk than women overall. Right. Um, I think if I'd have been a little boy instead of a little girl, all the times that the neighborhood moms from other households came to my house to tattle on me to my mom because I jumped from one side of the monkey bars to the other like right. a monkey or ran around up on top of the swing set like it was solid ground, or climbed the backstop of the baseball diamond, or jumped between trees in front of them, um, they, they, they wouldn't have been as worried about me. And, uh, right, yeah. You know, so boys are more likely, like I've got scars on my body from things that my, my mom was like, why did you do that? Uh-huh. And half the time my answer was I wanted to see if I could. Mm. And well, now, you know, you know, now you know that you can do that, but you're going to get hurt or now you know that you're going to fall. Um, very rare that I fell. But uh, that was normally something that boys do. So by the time a guy reaches adulthood, he's probably got at least one scar from doing something that an adult would consider stupid. But a child does because they haven't learned the negative outcomes yet sure. right some of the guys i grew up with had broken bones from that like we had a kid that broke his leg jumping off the roof of his house with a, a bed sheet thinking it might work as a parachute mm-hmm. and uh it didn't so he ended up in in a cast that we all signed for a period of time and his mom was just like i don't understand why did he do that you know and it, it like right. His his dad was like, I know why he did that, but I'm going to have to get him to think about things before he does them. <laughs> what can go wrong yeah. here? You know, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's another one. Like you got to have dads because dads are moms will just yeah. be like, don't do stuff like that. That's dumb. And dads will be like, what did you learn? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, dads, dads will have sort of that toughness of, all right, you, you, you fucked up. Now your foot is going to hurt for six Mm -hmm. weeks and mom moms will be like let's put a pillow under it and here you can have some extra popsicles because their their (laughs) hearts just ripped out right so they're gonna baby them and that nurturing is important too and and it's important to see the two different reactions together because if you only get one or the other it changes your develop development and it changes whether or not you have compassion for people who've made mistakes Mm -hmm. and it also changes whether or not um you can hold people accountable for not making the same mistake over and over again. Yeah. And uh, so as again, kids need to be raised by two parents. They need to be mm-hmm. raised by a masculine parent and a feminine parent. And mm-hmm. the overwhelming majority of the time that has to be a mom and a dad. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. you may find times where there's a more masculine dad and a less masculine dad where you have two gay men raising a kid and, and mm-hmm. a kid is going to get similar benefits. Um, yeah. I think fewer times where it's lesbians because they're more emotional overall. Uh, mm-hmm. um, even yeah. butch women, it's, it's rare to find a woman that is equal to a man in, in terms of uh, emotional regulation. Yeah. But yeah. even among lesbians, mm-hmm. yeah. But it can happen. It's just not common. Right. So. It's, it's it's bad to think that so typical enough that we will we'll find it in like equal parity or anything like oh, that. Oh, no, like, no. no it's yeah, not equal. No, nowhere near that. Yeah. No. Yeah. And it shouldn't have to be. It shouldn't be something where, you know, um, being married and having a, a family should necessarily mean that you have to be parents. Mm-hmm. Right. That we shouldn't put pressure on same sex couples to conform to the, the nuclear family model. Mm-hmm. We should be able to accept same sex couples and their life partnerships with a childless household and right. still respect their relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you're saying that you know, there's a bit of pressure for same sexes to have actually have adopted children. Yes. There's a huge yeah. amount of pressure. And uh, and it's not fair to the the couple, and it's not fair to the children. Mm-hmm. Right? It's yeah. not wrong for people to want to take care of a child that nobody else is taking care of. Right? Sure. And that happens. And it's not wrong for people to want to nurture children. But it is wrong to say, well, you have to have parental status. Right? Um, for instance, let's say imagine I had another brother besides the brother I had and that brother was gay um, and and got married. Um, their way of wanting to nurture kids, you know, like that couple's way of wanting to nurture kids could involve wanting to be dads, mm. but it also could just involve, you know, wanting, wanting to teach whatever they learned as a profession, whether it was, photography like i grew up with or programming or music or construction work or whatever anything that a guy would do and maybe wanting to teach some things about that to to their their nieces and nephews um there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that being the only way they feel like nurturing kids yeah yeah exactly you know? yeah. I, mean, I want to teach my nephew how to throw a baseball okay that's good mm-hmm. teach him how to throw a baseball like yeah. that's positive interaction like that yeah. should always be encouraged. My, um, uh, one time, uh, back when, uh, my brother's family was still living close to us before they moved uh, out of state. Um, uh, I think, I don't remember how old he was, maybe two years old, my nephew. Right. And mm-hmm. he, he liked, he liked to hang out with me and I, I decided to like, uh, teach him how to, to play Super Mario 64, and I let him have the controls. So it, it, it was pretty fun. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it, trying to get Mario to move forward, and maybe I think he got him to jump a few times. You know, he still didn't. You know, he was a very, very, very curious kid. You know, like uh, so you had to keep him away from things like batteries and stuff like that. Dangerous oh yeah, stuff. yeah. 
Yeah, that was still. me as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, it, uh, it, it's always fun uh, to have to kind of you know, it, uh, uh, what, what's the word uh, impart that th- th- those kind of things yeah. to him. And one time at CC's Pizza, because uh, we were having lunch there, uh, uh, I, I did I, I just did a crane game that um, was pretty hard, but I, but I managed to get like this huge popsicle that had like little popsicles inside. And, and once I got that, I, I gave it to the kid. He liked that. Yeah. Um, and I had the huge dinosaur. Uh, outfit for halloween for for once in my life i was in the hall in, in the halloween spirit and he and apparently this was after they moved but uh, uh my nephew was just nuts about it <laughs> yeah. yeah we we had that kind of we had that kind of thing growing up i have uh two nieces and I, m- for me a lot of the stuff that i taught them was in the kitchen mm-hmm. um but and one of the th- one of the things that um, I taught them is cleaning the inside of a microwave, okay. because so you, you know you grow up with things like Chef Boyardee, which is mm-hmm. is honestly total trash food, but it, it's still yummy and it makes a good <laughs> snack. Mm-hmm. Or or you grow up with, with you know like at my house we had a we have a spaghetti recipe that came from a bar. My dad's stepdad was a bartender. So our spaghetti recipe and our chili recipe both came – they were bar recipes and where you made the base recipe and then you had stuff on the table that people could add um, so that it was – anybody could eat it, even if they mm-hmm. were wimps about spice and stuff. Sure. Um, so you, know, you would make a ton of it, and then you would reheat it a lot. And if it blows up in the microwave, by the time you get it out, it's dried to the inside of the microwave. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my my one niece was just complaining about that because you know at, at their house their microwave the whole inside of their microwave was just caked and they were trying to get it clean and they couldn't get the stuff off and I was like all right so you're gonna take about half vinegar and half water and you're gonna boil it in the microwave and you're gonna let it continue to boil for close to a minute. Not not enough for it to blow up. You don't want it to blow up, but you do want it to continue steaming after it stops boiling. And then you let it sit for a few minutes. And then you open up a microwave, you take that dish out, and then you clean. Don't use mm. bleach. You know? And uh, so she, she did that. And, and it just – it softens it up and it wipes it all out. Mm. And you can – your microwave can look like somebody murdered a hamster in there. And that will get it clean. And mm. – you know, their mom didn't know that. Um, there were a lot of things that she taught uh, the kids that I didn't know because she she grew up on a farm. So, the, so you know, there were there were things uh, about handling animals and stuff that um, my kids learned from her that I wouldn't have known. My mom knew, but they weren't things that were important for me to learn, and I never learned them. Um, and uh, she was way better at picking out cuts of meat than I was because mm. <laughs> she yeah. had helped. She had helped to create those cuts of meat. She, she could, she could butcher a, a whole steer. Um, mm. But uh, in any case, like I, uh, it, it was fun for us to contribute to the upbringing of each other's kids. And, uh, you know, my, I had an aunt who didn't ever get married and have kids. Right. And she was a big influence in my life. And, you know, I had I had some cousins. I didn't have any uncles that didn't get married, but I had some cousins that were adults when I was a kid who were not married yet, who were mm-hmm. uh, influential to me as well. And mm-hmm. very, very influential in, in things that I learned about how to deal with other kids in conflict and stuff. And so there was the idea that you have to be the parent to be a good influence on a kid is bad. And yeah, I, I, one thing that really bothers me, um, our society has created this myth, this really deeply dangerous myth, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that the way to prevent um, bad influences on a child is to surround the child with women and exclude men who are not Ugh. the child's parent and oh, sometimes even yeah, the child's crazy. dad. And they, it's it's discussed as if every man who is um, interested in nurturing and caring about a child is a potential molester. 
right? Oh yeah, even yeah. Lauren Southern was like, oh, like, like, like no, no man should be like looking after kids, and like no group of men should be looking after kids or something like some something like that. It was a really some years back she said something like that. Yeah, I pissed some of us off. And it's a really dangerous mentality for two reasons. First of all, the people most capable of physically protecting a child using strength and threat level against yeah. somebody that would hurt the child are men. Mm-hmm. Hands yes. down, nobody is scarier uh, in terms of a, a physical fight than a man. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, now, granted, there's variation. There are some big women, like Carrie Nation was scary as fuck. Um, mm-hmm. She's the, the woman that was the head of the Women's Christian Temple or temperance movement that carried an axe around and busted her, up yeah, tables at her, bars and stuff. Yeah. She was mm-hmm. six feet tall, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my dad's mom was six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> she was not. She was not mean though, so she was not scary like that. But in any case, um, there, there's so there are women that that are capable. But the majority of the situation, like if you, if there is a predator. And there is somebody wanting to threaten the children in the neighborhood. The person that they're going to be the most afraid of is a man who is dedicated to preserving and protecting the safety and welfare of that child. Right. Especially if their actions might anger that man. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, at the same time, people think of women as being the, the safest people for children to be around. And right. even though abusers are a minority in both sexes um they are not more of a minority among women than they are among men right right? even though most men and women might be perfectly safe to be around children and would do everything they could to instinctively by the way to protect and care for a child that that they they saw in a vulnerable situation that wasn't being helped you know, the small percentage of people that would do harm to a child, children are more vulnerable when that person is a woman because they're raised yep. to trust and they're they're not afraid of her. And if she is violent, she doesn't have the level of control. She doesn't grow up learning to control her violence the way a man grows up learning to control his violence as a boy uh, because she doesn't face the same consequences for violence growing up as a girl. And then on top of that, the research that um, we've been talking about lately online, and I, I've got the book sitting around here somewhere that it's from, and I don't see where, where I stuck it. But there is a study where college women were asked about um, like their behavior on a scale of sexual aggression from zero you know, both parties are consenting and interested and and everything to very violent. And one of the questions that was asked was whether or not they had used the fact that they were an adult and the other person was underage, um, that they had had sex with somebody as an adult who who was a minor. And 29.3 said yes. 29.3% 29.3% said yes. Yep. So that is almost 3 out of 10. Mm. You know, the, the M&M's meme that feminists did with 1 in 10, the idea that 1 in 10 men yeah. might be a rapist. That's yeah. 3. 3 in 10 women. That's That's mm. almost a third of women by college age have have had relations you know that 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 really constitute rape Mm -hmm. and and that's just the ones that went after underage kids right there were like one in five one in five used violence one in four threatened violence um there was like eight percent had used a weapon Mm -hmm. um so this was Women have the capacity for sexual violence. And then you also have um, the issue of like childhood abuse, just uh, yes. children being beaten or children being uh, emotionally abused and stuff like that. And uh, among fatalities in childhood abuse, where the, the child is neglected to death or beaten to death or starved to death, yep. um, you know, murdered, whatever, 
those uh, women, the the mothers, outnumber the fathers, like by seventy. There's seventy percent of the children that are killed by one parent are killed by their mothers, and then on top of that, you also have the mothers outnumbering the fathers in terms of physical abuse, and among people who are not relatives, it's workers in industries that are female dominated and that they're female dominated specifically because men have been shamed out of working at these places because it's been assumed that they would abuse so daycare center workers for instance babysitters and stuff like that are more likely to abuse Mm. um so the fact that somebody is a woman it doesn't necessarily make women more likely individually to abuse but it does mean that you can't look at someone and say well that's a woman therefore they won't right like therefore the child is safe if that person is a stranger you don't know that right and at the same time you know the idea of eliminating men from a child's life because that's how you protect the child from abuse is pretty much debunked by the fact that most abuse is perpetrated by women mm-hmm. It doesn't mean they won't be abused, and, and and it's important for children to have that nurturing for both sexes. So you, the statistics <clears throat> kind of show that the only real way that you determine, you know, is my child going to be – is going to have a good relationship with this family member where they're getting family camaraderie and family bonding and nurturing and care and – positive experiences, love and consideration and protection, uh, or is this person going to be abusive to my child, is to vet the individual person for character without regard to their sex, without regard to you know any kind of racial or other physical demographic, and it's just, how does this person act? What do I know about this person? And you can't differentiate between men and women with that. You have to understand that it's the character of the person that determines whether they're going to behave that way or not. And you can't deny your children relationships with their family members on the basis of sex and expect that to, to protect them or benefit them in any way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we really should have more men in those industries too, because yeah, I think people behave better when both sexes are present. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, we got the freedom of association to make those separate, but but of course, with some hypocrisies. But yeah, I think uh, this is also not obligatory either. We should use that freedom of association to uh, actually do some mixing and work together as well. Yeah, and yeah, there it's important in other ways too. Like you get a nursery school or um, a a daycare center. A nursery school is more of the kids are actually actively learning things like their their alphabet and stuff like, stuff they would have learned in kindergarten when I was a kid. Um, But when you have male teachers in those environments, it helps the kids develop a better understanding of that formation of rules for playtime and stuff and sportsmanship. Um, And being able to like answer a question and be wrong and instead of being embarrassed that you were wrong looking at it as an opportunity to to learn something that you didn't know before yeah. and you end up with if you take all of the men out of the situation you very often don't have anyone in the environment that imparts those important lessons and the kids might learn their abcs mm-hmm. but they don't learn the abcs of how to interact with each other on a on a um, diplomatic level, mm-hmm. and, you know, they don't learn the ABCs of getting good, you know, <laughs> yeah. and same thing with preschool or not preschool, but, um, daycare centers where the kids are just sort of being warehoused. They're not necessarily being given lessons in anything, um, where you're in an environment where you have a lot of free time and you have a lot of people around you. It's important to have the masculine um, means of of getting along with each other and using your time in an entertaining way and 
uh, making sure people uh, have a good time using their time that way and it's a meaningful experience and stuff like that um and and being okay with uh taking turns and be getting getting dirty um getting mud on your pants or you know um getting losing the game and uh, getting something out of how hard you played and and learning from the things that the winners did and the things that how they differed from what you did and so on like we end up in a situation with uh, all women in those environments where uh, you get the everyone needs a trophy mentality. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think men could prevent that. And uh, it would make a huge difference in how strong each generation is if we had a way to include both sexes in those professions. It's tough yeah. getting men in those professions partly because they don't pay well. And men have to support families and so they have to go for higher paying jobs. Mm-hmm. But I mean, guys that are still in college, guys that are just out of college and haven't gotten a better job yet, you know, all kinds of um possibilities exist. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I've had. Uh, in terms of questions, uh, we we were we're almost at the three hour mark, so we we've got a lot in this time. I'm, I'm yeah, glad we got everything in. There. Is there anything else you wanted to kind of add to all this? Um, I guess I would just want to strongly repeat the importance of you know raising kids as as much as possible, raising kids in two parent homes with mom and dad, and how important that is for the kids development and it's not that people who didn't get to have that development are defective but there are chances um that they may have missed out on there are are things that are harder for him for them uh to develop and they may have their outcomes the things that you want to have happen in your life being able to be in a relationship of your own being able to have um a a uh a job that supplies the resources that you want, you need for the things that you want, you know, and things like that, staying on the right side of the law. It's a bigger struggle for people who don't get that start. And so even though I'm not arguing that we should shame parents that don't create that environment for their children, it's very important that we recognize that's the ideal. That environment is the ideal. And everything else that is not in that that is not that environment is not ideal. And so you 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 strive for that. And then if you don't get that, you struggle to make up for it. And those are your two options. You don't act like a lot of women act today in society where you have to say this is just as good when it's not and Mm -hmm. ignore the fact that, that, that there may be things that your kids need that you may have to seek external resources um, in order to to help them develop the way they should so that they can have functional adulthoods and be happy people. You know, women are very, very selfish for and demanding that it be treated the same. Well, thanks, uh, Hannah, for um, hanging out with me today uh, once again. Um, always love having you. Thank you. I was glad. Co- Glad to be on, and it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, sure thing. All right, and uh, one, one thing before I go is that uh, if you are listening to this now, um, if you are subscribed to my subscribe star uh, on the two dollar tiers and up, uh, you can ask a question to the uh, the interviewee, and and, uh, and 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 we'll have it read read to you, and she'll answer, or or he will answer. So um, so strongly consider that. Uh, I could use all the help I can get. Anyway, thanks again, Hannah. I'll catch you uh, some other time. All right. Thanks again. And we'll talk to you later. Sure thing. Bye.